Today, I'm speaking with Abra Miller. Abra, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. And Abra is out in Washington State. I'm here all the way on the other side in Georgia. Um, but Abra is a 39-year-old stay-at-home mom to five children and a stepmom to two 16-year-old twin daughters who live with their mother. And she has two biological daughters who are 17 and 14 and three sons, age 12, uh, 10, and eight months. Is that right? That's correct. That's a busy household. Uh, you probably don't get <laughs> it is. too much. I'm surprised you found the time for, for this interview. Um, <laughs> It's hard to find time with that many kiddos. And she and her husband own a small business making hot sauce. I got to ask, do you go for the ghost peppers? Oh, yes. <laughs> nice, nice. Hotter the better. <laughs> awesome. And she's also a former uh, student at New St. Andrews, which is going to become part of our um, part of our story here. And she was also a member of Christ Church and, and other uh, CREC uh, churches for about 18 years. And we'll go into all that and some definitions shortly. But before we dive into the main story, what else should we know about you, Abra? I stay home. I'm busy at home. I like to cook and I'm a terrible gardener, but I keep trying and with varying degrees of success. So that's what I do to stay busy when my kids are, aren't home. <laughs> does, does what you uh, plant in the garden and grow, does that become part of your hot sauce or is that separate? Not yet. We've tried some uh, pepper growing, but it's really not hot enough, long enough here. To do that. So we're still ordering our peppers, but gotcha. we'll get there. Very cool. Well, um, I did just want to give a brief disclaimer before we jump in. Uh, most of my interviews are with uh, atheists or at least agnostics, people who have left Christianity pretty much entirely or at least uh, partly. And I know that for many people who come to my channel, that's a, a point of safety for them. They, they don't want to be triggered. This is going to be an interview that's a little bit different. Um, I've done a series now. I think I've got two, uh, maybe three called Christchurch Rampant. And this is another iteration of that, those interviews where we're talking about Christchurch in Moscow, Idaho with uh, Pastor Doug Wilson and, and the people that are uh, part of that story. So it's important for me because this is uh, what I consider a cult. I mean, I, I consider any version of Christianity a cult, but this is a version of Christianity that even many Christians consider a cult. So hopefully that tells people something. But um, I did just want to give a disclaimer. This is, uh, we, uh, Abra, you are a theist, right? Is that I am your atheist? Mm -hmm. So at that point, <laughs> if anyone feels uncomfortable with the interview, please feel free to uh, jump to a different one. But if you are able to stay, I believe we're we're going to hear some interesting things that are um, both helpful for us to understand what's going on there in Moscow, uh, but also to understand some of the trauma that people are healing from when they leave these. Uh, so even if people aren't getting involved in the Moscow story at all, in the Christchurch story, to understand that some of this religious trauma stuff that we're going to talk about. It might be from a different church, different denominational background, but there's going to be some parallels that I think hopefully will help people to understand how to help people coming out of those, whether they're Christians or, or not at that point. Uh, but with that being said, I did want to pass the ball to you to, to tell us your story. So start as, as early as you'd like to with uh, where you're coming from. Okay. Well, um, I was a part of Douglas Wilson's churches. I went to several of them as I moved across the country and um, followed my first husband around as he uh, pursued his career. But um, we were almost always at CREC. So that's the denomination that Douglas Wilson's churches belong to. Um, so I've been to four, no, five or six of them, including the ones that my father is still at. Um, do you recall what but, this, that those letters stand for? Uh, Christ reformed evangelical churches, I think, Okay, but, but I could be wrong. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> um, so I joined as a teenage girl when I was going to new St. Andrews college. Um, and I stayed at all their churches. Apparently if you don't renew your membership regularly every few years it lapses and they want you to retake vows first time I heard that was when I left so <laughs> I don't know apparently that's a thing um I left after my marriage failed after um almost two decades and we have four kids together and it was a really um it was the hardest time in my life I really loved my husband um, we had met as teenagers. He had been my first everything. Um, and so when our marriage wasn't reconcilable, it just broke my heart. Initially, I had wanted to stay in the church. I wanted the stability for our kids. They were all at really, um, really important ages. They're 13 to five at the time. Um, 
And I wanted to keep that infrastructure for them of the community. I didn't want to displace them more than I absolutely had to. I knew that the divorce was going to displace and my parents divorced. Um, and so I was hoping like if we could just keep our friends around us. I will still go to church with them, even if I don't agree with everything that's going on. Um, and at that point I had been in counseling for a long time, uh, about six years. And some of it was biblical counseling. Some of it was licensed professional care. Um, some of it was religious, some of it was not, but it, it could had consistently come back that the marriage, um, needed some big changes. If it was going to be viable, it had started taking tolls on my health. Um, the police needed to be called. It was, it was a pretty ugly situation. Um, so I decided before I went to the church, I decided to go ahead and um, separate from my husband. And I was just asking that they would be there for the kids and I basically, and him as well. Like I could see this was, <laughs> this was tumbling out of control really quickly. Um, and I still cared about him. I wanted him to be okay. Um, but they wanted to decide for themselves if I should be allowed to leave or not the marriage. And this was, I was 34 at this time. Um, they want to decide if uh, I would be allowed to leave. Um, and then they wanted me to also take membership vows again, um, submitting to my husband and agreeing to submit to them in whatever they decided. Um, the problem was that eight years earlier, I had come to them with some of the issues that were going on already. Um, and at that point, they had given me biblical grounds for divorce and asked if I wanted to continue or not. At that time, I did want to continue the marriage. Um, and they, uh, Toby Sumter gave us counseling at that time. Um, but eight years later, as I came back again, um, what I realized was that there had not been, um, Toby had not been upfront with me. There had been concealing of things. Um, they had put me in a position to be a mother to my husband instead of a spouse. They wanted me to be an accountability partner and that wasn't working. Um, there had also been habitual, um, a lot of people were not telling the truth. <laughs> so um, I had trust issues. I was not only with my husband, um, but also with the church because they hadn't been upfront and honest with me. They'd actively participated in hiding things from me. Um, so when they wanted me to submit, I asked, OK, well, what are you what are you asking me to submit to here? I need to I need to know what's going on. Um, and they wouldn't tell me that. Um, but what they did do is um, they heard the part of the story I gave them, which was a small portion of it. I was still processing, um, still in a, a tremendous amount of pain about um, halfway through that first year. Um, we had already split up. They had actually removed my husband from the house and put him up in a church family's home. So I was at home with my kids. Um, at first it had been amicable and he was going to support us and he wanted me to be the kid's primary care provider. I'd been a stay-at-home mom all this time. Um, and then all of a sudden he didn't want to do that anymore. And so I had to start supporting my kids on my own. And um, I feel this is getting very rambly. But <laughs> Can I ask just for just for context, a couple of things. For anyone yeah. that doesn't know the group we're talking about, um, so we mentioned CREC, the, the, the denomination. So Doug Wilson has been the pastor of this church for decades at this point. And in terms of the mm -hmm. bigger context, there are there's a Logos school. Um, I think it's mm -hmm. is it Logos Press or Canon Press now. Uh, Logos Press or Logos School and Canon Press. Yeah. OK. And that's kind of their uh, it's, it's expanded exponentially from what I can tell. Um, mm -hmm. And then they've got Greyfriars Hall, which is for, I think, more like a seminar level. And of right. course, Christ Church itself is is like Doug Wilson's main church. And then there's other churches close by, correct? Like you mentioned, Toby Sumter, is that Trinity Reformed? Um, it was at the time. I okay. don't think he's there anymore. Uh, we had been part of the group when um, Christ Church got too big. They asked some of us to go to a church plant in the same town. And okay. at the time, Peter Lightheart was our pastor and Toby Sumter taught underneath him. So um, the first time I went to them for help, that was the dynamics. Um, mm. And so Dr. Lightwater was involved, but Toby Sumter was doing the actual counseling. Gotcha. And is it just, again, to paint a picture here before we dive back into some of your details, this church group, I mean, there, if, for people that don't know who we're talking about, there's a couple of big motifs, and I wanted to mention a few I know and ask you to add to it. Um, number one, they're ultra-Calvinists, correct? 
mm-hmm. um, which, yeah. which if you're not familiar with that, I won't dive into that uh, at this point, but for the people that are watching that know what that means, you know, that's a big deal, but mm-hmm. long story short from what I know of them. And I, I did not grow up in a CREC environment, but I did, uh, I did grow up actually uh, reading Credenda Agenda. Are you familiar with that magazine? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Grew up reading that. And I uh, got some exposure to Doug Wilson over the years. But basically, the end result is, from those of us who are kind of watching, um, including Christians who are watching, is an ultra arrogance. In other words, they, Mm -hmm. and they mix it with a cultural attack mode where they believe that they're in in a fight against cultural, uh, and a cultural battle, and that they believe that the world is basically becoming horrible, and that they have Mm -hmm. the responsibility to, to fight for Jesus. And so they're going to be arrogant, not just in their theology, but in their interactions with the world. In addition, you mix that with Christian nationalism and dominion theology, where they believe that they're supposed to eventually take over the world for Christ, not necessarily in this generation, but, you know, work toward that goal for the future. You, you get people that really are arrogant across the board who think their opinion is, is, is as good as God's almost, Mm -hmm. and who believe that they need to dictate to everybody. And now the last big motif I wanted to mention, and then have you talk about it and add more to it if there's some more I'm missing, is patriarchy, ultra patriarchy. Yeah. What does, if you agree with all those three or four points I made, um, you know, what does that mean to you? But especially what does patriarchy mean in that environment? Um, patriarchy is something I grew up with. My parents were homeschooling in the um, late 80s and early 90s. They're actually spearheading it in Idaho, part of the groups that were... Um, fighting for our legal rights and that kind of thing. My mom had six kids and ran a bookstore of homeschool curriculum. (laughs) And ultimately the idea was that um, the man of the house, usually the father, um, has ultimate say over what happens in his home. Um, And that is mirrored definitely in Christchurch culture. I remember um, when I got married the first time, my parents weren't supportive of the marriage. And um, Doug Wilson told, we weren't going to have them involved. They weren't paying for the wedding. Um, And Doug Wilson said, no, you need to have your dad give you away. So he realizes he doesn't control you anymore. Now your husband controls you. (laughs) Mm. And I was, oh gosh, I was 20 at the time. And we'd been together since I was 17. So it didn't even, I didn't realize how awful that was (laughs) until I was much, much older. Um, As far as Calvinism, I am not, like, I was in the culture for a long time. I absorbed some of it, but I was a stay-at-home mom um, to a lot of little people who came very, very quickly, and my husband worked a lot. He was um, usually working full-time and in school, so um, a lot of times it felt like single parenting, even though I was married. And actually found later as a single mom that it was easier just to be a single mom than to be in that situation. Um, So Calvinism, I kind of get it. I have met Calvinists who aren't jerks. (laughs) So I I suspect that it is the type of people who are attracted to Douglas Wilson um, cultivate this kind of arrogance that we're seeing, that they're just naturally have those inclinations anyway. I'm not sure how much we can actually attach to Calvinism so much as uh, personality, but I'm still learning. I don't know. <laughs> um, I rejected it when I left and was, I, I just needed to start over, um, start from scratch again. The one arrogance that I've noticed a lot from, and I honestly have not followed everything he's written, but I've noticed a lot of arrogance against the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and they really mm-hmm. attacked them viciously. I was even, um, watching a, a video of Doug's recently. And uh, he said something to the extent of, let's see if I can get it here. He said, we believe that every form of woke sex is demented and twaddlesome, uh, whatever the hell that means. Uh, we believe that there is no such thing as an LGBTQ plus community. Real communities are built as a result of a husband and wife having normal sexual intercourse. And I think he's gone a lot further than that in his attacks. I think mm-hmm. that's probably the one of the softest things he said. But he really just, if you don't agree with what he considers a biblical worldview, he attacks people viciously. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. There's vitriol. He's angry. Mm. Um, I I don't understand for people. I mean, his group believes that um, they post-millennial. So they believe that um, 
we're supposed to be making a better world. Like the world's supposed to be getting better, but I'm not sure. And it was never super clear to me how that fits into their culture wars. Um, everyone is an enemy. We need to change everything. And they have this big thing about um, taking back. They want to take back Halloween for us because it was originally ours. <laughs> Bring order to the world, which on the one hand, I can get behind, like we're supposed to be helping. We're supposed to be um, cherishing one another and valuing each other and bringing, um, making the world a better place. I can absolutely get behind that. What I don't get behind is policing one another and hating each other when we are different. Um, and the arrogance that comes along with, which I don't think it's just them. I think Christians generally really struggle with the concept that um, the Bible can be inerrant, but our translations are definitely not coming from a place of inerrancy. Um, and I think that's yes. where a lot of the hatred towards the queer community comes from is misunderstanding the Bible or not knowing how to read it well. Um, it's only been in recent years I've actually learning how to read my own Bible instead of just taking what people said, like Doug Wilson, as gospel truth. And it's changed my views a lot about um, enough things that people don't necessarily think I'm a Christian anymore. So <laughs> that's their problem, would, not mine. <laughs> would his group... It be included in that would they would they say you, you you're very suspect as a christian they do say that yeah hmm. which i mean it's kind of sad because they're telling these things to my kids but on the other hand i think it's a good thing for my children to see that there's a lot of different ways to do christianity that it's not the bible doesn't restrict us to only one reading we have the free will to interpret it the way we want and it's important what we do with those beliefs hmm. It's interesting you talked about him uh, taking things back. And I, I've seen he has this thing he does, I think, every November called No Quarter November, where <laughs> yeah. it's just like this very, uh, very warf warfare uh, driven mentality. And I think even his father wrote a book about uh, the warfare tactics. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of their their aggressive behavior is, is based on some of the ideologies of, of, um, of Doug Wilson's dad's book. But it's interesting to me, and this is a slight divergence, pardon me for adding it, but I have to, the idea of taking it back, you know, taking mm -hmm. like, like the, the rainbow, for example, maybe for, for, for Noah <laughs> versus the LGBTQ plus community, it's, it's the idea of like that they're taking this original idea and it's, it's being twisted by the world. So let's take it back. But part of my deconversion, and for those who don't know me, I was uh, a Christian for over 40 years in ministry, I uh, went to Bible college to be a pastor. But one of the biggest things that helped me was to realize that some of the stories were actually copied from somewhere else. So if we want to be mm -hmm. fair to say, let's go back to the original, let's take it back. It's like, okay, Dionysius changed water into wine first. Hermes walked mm -hmm. on the water with his golden slippers first. Uh, <laughs> Zeus cried drops, you know, tears with drops of blood in them first. Helios had a purple robe and a crown around his head first, much, much earlier. And it's like, you know, you want to go back to the original, like it's, there's an, there's a, right. there's an earlier original. But anyway, I, I digress. Um, <laughs> with with that dynamic, uh, going back a little bit to to patriarchy and the arrogance yeah. of it. Yeah. Did do you think you or just women in general in that group would grow up feeling like your property in a sense? Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Does, I think. Um, I felt. Well, it got worse as I as I went on, but I definitely went like from my father's house to my husband's house. Um, and there were things I weren't allowed to do. I wasn't um, allowed to vote the way I wanted to vote. I was expected to vote the way my husband told me, which was the way his father <laughs> mm. wanted them to. Um, uh, he told me I was not allowed to uh, disagree with um, his family. Um, uh, particularly his father. But it, there was also just this, the the power dynamic. There We're not equals. It's very complementarian. And I didn't realize until I was much, much older how harmful that was, how you can't have a healthy, open conversation with somebody who, who has last say, like their opinion matters more. And that's very clear. Um, so how are you supposed to have an opinion, something we dealt with um, during court proceedings um, when we were doing the custody, um, <laughs> the custody horrible stuff that we had to do, um, was they they kept pushing, well, you let them do this while you were married. You put them in the school. You went to this church. And what didn't seem to get through was I didn't have a choice. Um, I remember mm -hmm. 
once or twice where I was allowed to have a say in what church we'd go to, but mostly because at that time he wasn't going to church. He was working on Sundays. So there was, <laughs> um, but there were other times when he actually would try to force me to test my submission, a lovely idea from Toby Sumter, um, to see how submissive I was if he decided to do something that he knew I would disagree with. Even if he didn't agree with it, he wanted to test me to see if I would do it anyways. And I did, <laughs> which is terrifying now, but that's where I was. Um, mm. it was, it, it was, I feel like I was infantilized to the point where it got so bad, I didn't know who I was anymore. I was doing everything for him. I was, um, you know, all my hairstyles had to be approved initially by my dad and then by my husband. I wasn't allowed to cut it without permission, um, color it without, style it. It was a whole thing. So when I emerged out of that at 34, I didn't know how I liked my hair. I didn't know what nail polish colors. I, uh, there was nothing. I didn't know how to dress myself for myself. I didn't know what movies or books or foods I liked because it had all been pushed to what the head of the household wanted. Um, mm. And they're just, I had no idea. Now I know. <laughs> the, the word mind, mind job is coming to mind a lot. It's yeah. crazy. <laughs> I was curious with, with that, the two big words are popping kind of like as, as red flags. The, the word, control or control freak maybe um of a mentality from from their side but also autonomy um it sounds like on the control side they wanted it all and on the autonomy they wanted to make sure you had very little is that fair mm -hmm. to say yeah i would agree with that hmm. yeah could i ask your clarification on the voting thing did you ever hear anyone say they'd prefer that women don't vote i didn't hear that okay. um no. I've seen that from some of the people in that group. So I was curious if you'd heard it. I've seen it online. I didn't hear it in person. Um, okay. And that good. was after I, I removed myself. <laughs> so mm. <laughs> I think, I actually think it's gotten worse over the years. I think when I initially joined in the early 2000s, um, they were less uh, open about what they believed. And it was a little more subtle, a little more behind closed doors. Um, and I think, especially recently, they've gotten very bold about what they say and aggressive and often childish about how they say it. Um, I think they're, they, they used to have some um, awareness of how the way they were coming across and how that reflected on Christians in general. But I think that's kind of flown out the window in recent years. Do you think that that's in some ways a sense that the other Christians have become traitors to true Christianity and they're like, we don't really care what you think because you're not really necessarily one of us, or at least you don't act like it. Like we're the true Christians. You think that comes into play at all? I think that's the underlying belief. Um, I don't think they're all that way. I think there are some people at Christ church who are honestly just doing their best. Most of them, I would say honestly doing their best just to love God. Um, but yeah. they're following a poor leader. Um, I think the people in leadership definitely believe that. Um, that was something that was, communicated while I was there. Um, they don't socialize a ton outside of their own group. It's very much insulated and you don't have a lot of contact uh, with other Christians outside. I think um, Douglas Wilson's gotten old and he, he's starting to slip. Um, and I mm -hmm. think that's why we're seeing a lot of what we're seeing now. Yeah. I was curious. Um, I appreciate you entertaining my questions because in some ways I understand uh, I've done a lot of, a lot of research um, to in one sense, but I'm not, you know, on the inside track. I did not go there. I've never even visited the group. So I, I, in some ways, I still have a lot of questions about the dynamics. One of the, one of many questions I had, um, and this is something that's come up, you've probably seen it come up a lot. And, it, and if you want to just take this back to your story at this point, that's fine too. But um, when a man uh, gets married to a woman in that group, if the woman feels that he is being abusive, verbally, physically, all the above, whatever, if she feels threatened and unsafe, is she allowed to say no to sex from the church's that perspective? Was, um, I was up. So when I was given grounds twice by the church, um, they admitted that it was the first time it was grounds in one area. And then the second time I was, no, you have grounds on every count. Um, divorce. This marriage. Yeah. 
So this marriage has been, um, the covenant vows have been violated often and intentionally so many times that this, this isn't really a marriage anymore. Um, and this definitely isn't honoring God. Mm. But during the process, particularly when Toby was counseling us, I was explicitly told never to say no. Um, it was, I know you feel betrayed right now. I know you feel alone. I know you're hurting, but don't tell him, no, that's just going to push him away. You need to be there for him. Um, and I complied uh, to the detriment of my own mental, um, emotional, and physical health. Um, I Permanent damage. I was diagnosed with PTSD, um, which I received treatment for, and I'm doing better than I've ever done before, which is amazing for me. Um, but there's still the I still have the physical damage that was done, um, and I think if I wish they were more comfortable, or at least they were humble enough to get licensed professionals involved when the situation is so bad that it's beyond their scope of knowledge. Um, what I was dealing with. Um, the second time I went in, I was at Trinity Reformed Church and I talked to Pastor Apple and I just explicitly asked him, I was like, have you ever seen a case, uh, a marriage that had gone this badly, that was this severely <laughs> wrong? And he said, no, this is the worst one I've ever seen. And I was like, well, what makes you think that you guys can help me with this then if you've never dealt with something this bad? And he's like, well, we have to practice somewhere. And my thought was like, not on me though, not on my family. We are not your practice people. Um, mm. At one point I asked him about PTSD because I had already been diagnosed with PTSD. Um, and I had even given the pastor like full access to talk to my counselors. It wasn't like I was hiding something. I wasn't afraid. Um, and I said, do you know anything about PTSD? And he points to a book on his shelf and goes, yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> Ah, no, <laughs> no, you don't. So that's a no. Um, and that was when I started to withdraw from them was when they made it very clear that not only were they ill-equipped to handle this, they were too arrogant to realize that they shouldn't be touching it at all. Um, it wasn't until after I left that I began to realize how much I had bought into the patriarchal culture that I was even interested in them supporting me. Um, it would have been nice to have community, but at the same time, it wasn't their job to tell me whether or not I could get divorced. That's outside. They don't get to decide that. They're not in my marriage. Um, there's only two people in my marriage. And depending on the issue, one or both of you may be reliable, um, but you have to have the education to understand those dynamics before you can even go near it. And the, the church's job is supposed to be to speak the truth and to love and to help and None of that was happening. They weren't speaking the truth. They certainly were not loving me or my husband or my children. Um, and they weren't helping us. <laughs> they were just, they just wanted control of a situation they had no business controlling and absolutely um, a gross lack of training that would have even given them a shot at getting involved. Um, I do think it's important um, when they decided they weren't going to help me unless I submitted to them, whatever that meant. And at this point, they were already withholding information from me. Um, the only reason they were even entertaining this idea is because my husband had gone in and, and affirmed part of my story himself, um, admitted to what I was saying. So otherwise, they wouldn't have even entertained what I was saying. They had to have a man affirm what I was saying. Um, they so they wanted me to go in and submit to whatever that was um, they weren't telling me what was going on so i decided to take a step back and i just was going to church at that time just i was sitting with my kids i wasn't public about what's happening most people didn't even realize we had separated that he had moved out um but it got to the point where things uh, when the when things got antagonistic when he hired an attorney that was very aggressive basically um, the things switched almost overnight and suddenly it was like this, you know, hunger game style divorce that everyone hates, um, which was horrifying, um, and traumatic in of itself. We're still dealing with some of that, which has been, <laughs> it's a long five years. Um, nobody wins, but I, he would be doing things in one area and then he'd come up to church and be, it would be a totally different person. Um, and that was messing with my head. I asked the church to help. Like, can you at least, you know, 
give me a buffer so we, I don't have to talk to him at church. Maybe I could just worship and, and they weren't even willing to do that. So um, I went and found a different church that was a little more educated about it, enough that they were like, nope, we're going to protect you. We're going to keep an eye on you. We have a security system just so we'll make sure that you can worship here without being harassed. Um, and that's when everything went very, very sour uh, for me. Hmm. But yeah. Can I ask just for going back one step with the uh, husbands being able to um, force wives, if you can recall ever having conversations with other women, just giving a ballpark here, if women were honest about what had happened to them and would define it as marital rape, how mm -hmm. many stories would you say you've heard of marital rape in that congregation or community? I've heard five personally. Hmm. Um, the women are, we're not taught to think of it that way. Um, so it's not just that we don't think of it in terms of rape. We don't think of it in terms of having a choice. And we also don't think of it in terms as being enjoyable for both parties. Um, there is a push to have as many children as you can, as quickly as you can. That's holiness. Um, I even received pushback when I stopped after a four with my <laughs> first mm -hmm. husband. Um, it, it's not seen as something that's supposed to be necessarily enjoyable. You are a Dessert, you're something to be consumed. Um, mm. And that, uh, yeah, they didn't but, even know. They didn't even know what it was. It's. It seems like the word grooming is coming to mind. Like, it, it, I would think that if, if a woman had not grown up in that environment and it had not been exposed to it by a certain age, that some of these ideas would would stand out as, as like, even if, if they wanted to go to that church to say, I'm not, I'm not going to, we're not going to do it that way. We're not going to do our marriage that way. But it seems like if you grow up in it and you have this from, you know, logo school and, and, and new St. Andrews and church and, and your community, which you mentioned is very insular. Like if you're not really getting a different perspective, um, whether from a, a liberal Christian perspective from there, from, you know, Christ church's perspective, being liberal Christians, um, mm -hmm. cause there are, you know, there are, you mentioned other ways of interpreting the Bible. There are other people that have different perspectives on sexuality, even, even um, heterosexual sexuality, where you are allowed to easily say no and stand up for yourself and not be abused and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, treated like garbage by in a, in a marriage. But whatever, if, if you had any version of that in your, in your, in your toolbox, so to speak, when you came mm -hmm. to Christchurch, I would think that those people would say, even if we love it here for the worship or this, you know, the, the, the preaching, whatever, that mm -hmm. that they would say, we're not going to do our marriage that way. Like we're, I still have autonomy as a woman and you have autonomy as a man and you're still your own person and, and, and submission, you know, if you're going to, I don't, you know, care one bit about what Ephesians five says and how to interpret it. But, you know, from a Christian's <laughs> perspective, if you believe in mutual submission to say, well, we're going to, we're going to have mutual submission, even mm -hmm. with all that going on, it seems like that would be very different from someone who grew up in it. Do you feel like yeah. is grooming an appropriate word to use for some of these families? I think um, I think it's unintentional. I don't think um, people are being malicious necessarily. I think um, I know in my parents' home, my mom wanted to submit to my dad. She um, and they didn't even get to a point. They were first generation Christians. They they weren't even at a point to even be thinking about things. Um, you know, with my kids, I'm teaching them. We have these books about um, this is my body and y you get to pick because this is your body. If you want to shake my hand or give me a hug, we can ask permission and engage in consent. And this is what consent looks like. And uh, just on the very basic levels, you know, I pick up my baby. I, I'm going to pick you up now. Is that OK? Like it's it's part of the language. My parents weren't at a place where that even was on the radar. I think part of it's generational with awareness, but also if your life is super busy, if you're having all these kids, if you're overwhelmed, um, something we see habitually here is uh, the push to be a stay at home mom. It's, it's a, the impression you get is it's supposed to be more holy um, and you're supposed to have a lot of kids, but there's not really worked here to support big families. So now dad's working a lot and all this pressure's on mom. And now you're both exhausted and not connecting. And it just kind of spirals into this. Who mm -hmm. has time to talk about consent? You're just trying to survive. Um, yeah. And so at this point we are several generations in and we're seeing um, 
there was a kerfuffle recently over uh, Logos and their basketball team. And one of the boys from Logos was like patting the butts of the oppositional players. <laughs> He didn't see anything wrong with us. Apparently, uh, the coaches didn't either. Um, and one of the other kids um, was in, on the team was typing. These are high school students. And he goes, well, if you don't want to be touched, don't be in sports. And I was thinking, OK, wait a second here. This kiddo is the age where he's going to start dating soon. And he doesn't understand the difference between... <laughs> But hats for your team and the opposition. How is he ever going to understand consent when it comes to a girl? That's way more complicated. That's terrifying that he has no idea. Um, so I, I don't think it's malicious. I, I know a lot of the parents, again, they're just doing their best, but they're not using discretion. They're not um, taking what Doug says and running it through scripture or common sense, even. Even common sense would be great, um, but that's not happening. And I think it's that's why we're seeing a lot of these shocking outcomes. It it just blows my mind. I've, and I've heard some of this before. Some of it is, is a little bit new. But it every time I hear it, I just feel like I'm heartbroken for a couple of reasons. Number one, obviously, for the grooming that, that truly is grooming. It, it does seem like it happens. And I feel horrible for the people where these things are happening kind of in secret. You know, the, the stories you hear about the Jamin Wright and the Natalie Greenfield situation mm -hmm. and then the the Sittler story, you just, you, you sit back and you think there's so much stuff that even despite their desire to keep the purity and image of the church, and they, they really seem like they fight hard to say, we're some kind of model church. And mm -hmm. it's like, the more that they do it, it's like, they're trying to hold on to sand and it just, it's sifting, falling through their fingers. They're yeah. not a model church and their image, it just gets worse and worse as time goes on, in my opinion. Um, but you know, I feel bad for these people, but I also feel bad for the fact that like we're, we're talking at the moment about um, physical autonomy, the ability to say no to, um, you know, you, uh, someone's sexual intentions towards you and, and the ability as well to say, if, if we're going to be intimate, it's, it's a mutual pleasure. You know, this isn't just for you or for, for, for having a quiverful, quiverful mentality. Like there, mm -hmm. there's, there's more to this. I'm a person that, you know, has, has, uh, sexual desires too. And the fact that people are in this, but they don't realize it. And I, I just want to put a pin in this because it's, it's got a really strong parallel to my, my story. And again, this is not about my story. Um, and I don't want to bring mine in too much, but one of the biggest red flags that I had when I was, I deconverted about um, three and a half years ago, after about three ish years of, of intense study, I would have never said it will lead to deconversion. I would have said, you know, atheism's not on the table under any circumstances. <laughs> but what shocked me was not just the things I was learning, but the fact that the people who should have known never said it. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, I, I, for example, um, you know, went to Bible college. I went to Bob Jones University and Lancaster Bible College in uh, central Pennsylvania and mm -hmm. went to be a minister. I'd been in, in many ministry groups and under the authority of several different uh, pastors that I thought were wonderful at the time. And it wasn't just that I didn't know some of where the Bible came from, which I eventually figured out on, on my own very much so, but it was the fact that I got the sense that they, some of them, you know, maybe not all of them, but some of them must have known some information that they did not tell me. And mm. so it was the red flags went off originally, but there was like this, this secondary tier of red flags that would say, this information that I just learned is an issue, but it's also an issue that you guys don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like, um, like, for example, you know, uh, figuring out that there's about 200 quotes of the book of Enoch woven into the new Testament. I was always told there's two, not 200. And then I personally <laughs> found 200. I'm like, even if whatever you want to do with that information, like tell me there's 200 quotes in the book of Enoch in the new Testament. Mm -hmm. That's not fair to keep to people. And I feel like in the similar sense, like it's not fair to these girls to tell them there's a different way to think. Like you can still be patriarchal if you really want to, but there's more mm -hmm. than one, one, one way to see this. Right. And the end result that's shocking to me, kind of the punchline is I can't believe that, that women are teaching the next generation of women to want mm -hmm. this. Like it's not yeah. just the men saying we men are, are going to have a you know Taliban like a mentality. You're going to do what we say or whatever, mm -hmm. we're going to ostracize you and shun you, but it's the women teaching the women. Mm -hmm. How, how do you think women cannot see, like be in this so deeply 
see stories like yours, see stories like these others, and not be concerned to say, what are we doing to not just ourselves? What have we done to ourselves? But what are we doing to the next generation? Yeah. Um, I, I do see that. And I don't think it's necessarily... I think their their personal self-righteousness and personal holiness is probably tied into it. I know lots of women um, who are married to abusive men, what I would call abusive, um, maybe not call the police all the time, but not allowing them to have a voice um, in a home where, um, you know, they talk about dripping faucets and wives, but there's men who are dripping faucets too. They're contentious and nagging. And um, that's, that's not the way you treat somebody you love. Um, but I, these women, because that is hard, because it's a challenge and they're overwhelmed and they are told um, that holiness is keeping on a smile and just basically putting up with it. You're not really allowed to call them out. That is not smiled upon. I'm getting help for it. It's not smiled upon. Um, that that becomes them being a Christian warrior. And now this is a badge of honor that they've lived with this and over overcome it. And just but but when you're around that all the time, you develop a hardened sh shell to protect yourself, your body kicks in and all your um, emotions and it, you don't leave that kind of situation without some kind of change. And I think some of these women, it breaks, um, it got to the point for me where um, I, I couldn't leave my bedroom without it becoming um, an uncomfortable situation because we were at each other so much. Um, I wasn't sleeping because I was so stressed. Um, I, my health was failing, my mental and emotional health. It was all just culminating to a point where it's like, I can't be a mom anymore. Uh, but for some women, I think it makes them tough and um, unkind and they lose touch with compassion, especially in an environment where um, feelings are dismissed and empathy is shunned. Uh, it's really easy to go, hey, this is the fight God's called us to man up. Um, and I, I did see that I went to help from women a couple times, and they just pointed me to the men. Um, there's a harsh, a harsh, sharp edge with some women, um, especially the older women. Uh, they're very judgmental, not all of them, of course, but um, especially the ones in leadership tend to be pretty judgmental and see the world in black and white. And there's very little grace there and even less encouragement, unless they're encouraging you to do something the guys are, are championing. <laughs> hmm. you, you're, it's a good segue to a question I wanted to ask about the, the women uh, who are somewhat in leadership. Um, I, I know that's might be a bit of a misnomer, but um, <laughs> Nancy Wilson and their two daughters, I know mm -hmm. they speak a lot. Um, they do videos on Canon Press. Um, they have a book, a whole book thing going on, uh, I guess, to kind of press too. Um, they're, they're, they seem to be very vocal. And, and I've seen some videos from conferences that they do, um, which is, again, when I, when I look at this stuff, I think the same, like this, this gracelessness is, is just prevalent. And I've personally mm -hmm. experienced it in, in, in relationships in my life where I'm like, if, if this is the best you've got to invite me back to your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Like this doesn't right. look so good. This looks really great. No. And I did want to ask, like, have you had any interactions with uh, Nancy Wilson and her two daughters? And what role did they play? Even if not, what role do you see them playing in this? Uh, what I would consider a little bit of a theological empire there. Um, I have. I was. Um, I've met with Nancy a couple times in the context of being a college student and then marriage counseling. Um, I was at college the same time as Rachel. Um, and then I have sat down for coffee with uh, Rebecca once over um, her approach on modesty, which ironically, I was the one arguing for <laughs> grace and um, compassion. And she was the one who was not interested in that sort of thing, um, <laughs> which is weird because if you'd see us dressed, it, yeah, anyways. <laughs> I, I think, um, I think they're okay platforming women who aren't a threat, women who are going to further their cause. I think if you have a woman who's shown any sign that she is an independent thinker, that's not going to happen. Um, they need to be fully immersed. And I'd say, um, 
brainwashed and gaslit to the point that they are just regurgitating what they have been taught. I don't think there's a whole lot of original thought going on in those situations, um, which I don't I don't like to say because these women are worthy and valuable and should be respected. And that hasn't happened. Um, and that's how we got to this point in the first place was they weren't valued. Their perspective isn't valued. They've adopted something um, so that they could see themselves as worthy. Now they're being platformed. Now they're being noticed. Now they're given a place of honor, but they weren't being given a place of honor for just being themselves, for doing what they do, whatever that might entail, be it, you know, peeling potatoes or working outside the home. That's enough. You don't need to be special, um, special in order to be worthy. That's not how the gospel is presented to us. Um, we're worthy because we're made in God's image and that that's it. Um, so it makes me really sad when I see those are the women um, who they are giving a place of honor to. It's just because they're saying what they would say themselves. It's just a different package. Um, I do want to ask you, you've, you've said, if, described a few situations that, um, again, I'm big on like the words that kind of flash in my mind as you, as you tell the stories, but gaslighting. Um, it sounds like they're continually gaslighting each other, like the, the community, uh, uh, the leaders maybe to the community. Do you feel mm -hmm. like that's an accurate way to put it? And do, have you seen that kind of ex experience yourself? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that happened when I left the community um, was that they said they weren't going to support me. Um, and then one day I got an email, I was still attached to their, their emails that they sent to the whole congregation. And it basically said, um, Abra and her husband are getting a divorce. We know enough not to tell her she can't get a divorce, but nobody takes sides and nobody gossip. They hadn't asked my permission before sending that. They just basically did this huge announcement that they're broken up um, and that they weren't condoning it, but they also weren't supporting it. Um, so I, you know, went to talk to them about getting consent before making public announcements about other people's marriages. And nobody would talk to me about that except a new guy, a young new guy. And I was like, pastors on vacation magically. Um, <laughs> but then after I'd left, my kids started coming home because they're still going to church with their dad. And they're like, mom, um, they're doing a sermon series on men not abusing their wives. And they're like, I'm mortified. Everybody knows they're talking about you and dad. And I was like, oh, I'm you know, sorry that happened. But personally, I'm thinking that is so weird because they definitely were not supporting me <laughs> when I was needing their help, when my marriage was in trouble, but here they are pretending like they're going to be there for people that they know right from wrong. And that wasn't my experience. Um, it, they're setting themselves up as an authority on this issue when they had no business doing that. They were woefully underprepared, undereducated, um, and horribly prideful when it came to knowing how to handle a broken marriage. Um, so I feel like the whole congregation was gaslit into thinking that um, the church would be there for them and that the church had solid teaching on this when they did nothing. Like hmm. they literally said they would help, um, said they took care of things that I asked them to take care of because I was grieving heavily. I was like, can you just, you know, there was financial things. I needed to get a uh, paper sign. I was like, can you take care of this? And then the second they realized I wasn't going to sign on the dotted line, it was what? What did you say? I don't remember that conversation at all is what happened. Um, mm. I don't think people realize how heavy the gaslighting is. I'd even go so far as to say um, there is a chance some of the pastors, Pastor Apple has a very tender heart. Does he recognize that he's being gaslit? I don't know. I mean, I don't agree with him on a several points, but I'm not ready to say he's malicious. I am, um, I am certain he is uh, bought into the lie that he is equipped to treat people for things that he isn't equipped for. And I think he's bought into the lie that the ministry he has attached himself to by becoming a pastor at one of Douglas Wilson's churches um, is a worthwhile cause. He's failed to do his own homework, something that we're talk that talked about in the Bible is to work out our own salvation. And I think one of the big faults we're seeing is 
adults, including myself, not actually doing that. We're relying on other people to work out our salvation for us. And so we're getting these distorted ideas about what that means and how we should live and what the Bible says, because we're listening to a man and not fact checking. Um, that's how, that's part of the reason I got to where I got is I wasn't paying attention. I was just mm -hmm. doing what I was told. And I think our pastors are doing that too. Um, and it's alarming. We, we need to take responsibilities for ourselves and realize that we're talking to somebody who not only wasn't educated <laughs> to do the job that he's decided he's going to do. Um, there's lots of very concerning charges and um, legitimate accusations coming at him. And he's just basically like swatting him away like flies instead of engaging with them in a biblical manner. But he is holding all of these victims to a standard that he doesn't himself hold to. Hmm. It's amazing. I was wondering in the in the midst of all that, it seems like there's this ironic dynamic of of a lot of sexual, I don't know if you call it deviancy or, or issues, abuse. But mm -hmm. it seems like they've been more prone to these stories than some other churches that I've been exposed to. Um mm -hmm. what what like, do you think it's just ironic that so many things were happening in that church, or do you think there's a cause behind it? Like, where, whether you're looking at the the, the Jamin and Natalie situation, or the Sittler situation, or the the guy who got um, in jail for the the child porn mm -hmm. recently, um, I know there's other stories, your story, other stories. There's a lot of stories. Um, I, if you uh, saw, uh, you know, Lorena's interview on my channel mm -hmm. a few weeks ago, but you know, Lorena had some things to share. Uh, Lorena mm -hmm. Hieronymus. But yeah, you know, you you look at these and you're like it's a little too frequent, a little too many over, mm -hmm. you know, a long period of time to think that's just ironic. I mean, do you think there's something yeah. in, in, in the culture that's creating these sexual deviances? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, I, well, I think anytime there is a complementarian, so um, the husband has authority over the wife, um, you're not, you're, you're shutting down her voice to some degree. Um, and I don't think all I, I've seen very functional complementarian marriages, so I'm not like blacklisting okay. those or anything. Um, but I, I think if the one person doesn't have the ability to have a voice in the marriage, um, I think whatever proclivities the stronger voice has is going to ride roughshod. Um, in this community, in the Christchurch community, they also have a habit of not holding accountable people with sexual sins or sexual deviancies. Um, they are very quick to <laughs> say, forgive and forget, uh, which is not a, not a biblical construct at all. Um, mm. they, that's what they push. Um, if, if you've been a, a victim, they want you to forgive. And their focus is on the victim forgiving, not on holding the perpetrator accountable or even helping them necessarily. They just want it to be okay again. They want to sweep it under the rug. They want to make sure nobody's bitter. Uh, and when it happens again, which eventually happens because if you don't deal with the problem, it's just going to crop back up again. Um, and with sex, um, I'd say it usually gets worse, just the nature of the thing. Your neuro pathways are going to need more stimulation um, if you're not cultivating healthy habits. Um, so mm. it gets dialed up. And so the next time, so if a wife comes with this problem at this point, it's like, well, it's, you know, habitual porn. And they're just like, oh, you just need to give him more sex. Don't get better. Um, well, she comes back five years later and then, well, now it's child porn. And they're like, well, that's your fault. You're not giving him enough sex. They'll slap him on the wrist and keep him going. Um, hmm. And it just gets worse and worse. But what they're not addressing is, well, where is this coming from? Um, why is this a thing? What shame and guilt and weirdness has been left over from purity culture that this is something they're engaging in instead of cultivating a healthy relationship with a human being? Um, it just, they're not dealing with it. They, they don't even know, I don't think. Um, I was talking... I was reading Andrew Bauman's book and he's a Christian therapist and he talks a lot about pornography and the challenges that men have. Um, and he was talking about how many people you need to get involved as an accountability group when you're fighting um, an addiction. So we're not talking about occasional use. We're talking about this is overtaking somebody's life. It's replacing a spouse or a partner. Um, in my experience with Christchurch, it was, oh, we'll let the wife be accountable for for the husband's porn habits, uh, or we'll let a pastor do it who may or may not um, 
<laughs> he's not going to communicate to the wife either way. So that's not a great situation. But you need a company of people to support somebody who's trying to change these really hard habits, these really toxic things that are destroying them. They're um, hurting their ability to have a good memory and to their satisfaction in life. And there's all these, it's not just Christian culture saying it's bad, it's the greater scientific community now saying habitual use um, is not a healthy thing. But the church is totally not on board with that. They're just telling the wives to go fix the problem. Um, so yeah, I think uh, between that, their their unwillingness or lack of um, knowledge on how to deal with sexual deviancy, and then just the type of person who's attracted to Doug Wilson is likely going to be somebody who's more aggressive, somebody who's patriarchal, um, because mm. that's the vibe he's putting out there and that's what you're gonna attract. <laughs> Yeah. Do you, I think I've asked this already, but I just want to make sure I'm clear. Cause I've, I've read something recently from uh, Michael Foster, who uh, has worked with Doug Wilson. Uh, he's the author of the book. Mm -hmm. It's good to be a man. And uh, which I believe the co-author um, is even more patriarchal probably, but the idea mm -hmm. that it, again, the issue the topic of sex, that if you get married, it's implicit like like you have given consent if you've said i do then consent is implicit to them and you can't obviously divorce would take that back but until mm -hmm. you're divorced or separated um if you're married then your consent is already given is that do you think that plays a part in the role that in the sense that like uh, i think i've read a a quote here let me see if i can find it here in my notes as well um but something from nancy wilson about um the, you know the idea of your 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 husband's garden and he's allowed to tend it or something like that Do you know which what i'm talking about yeah he's not trespassing in his own garden yeah he's not trespassing in his own garden <laughs> um do you think that 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 plays into the some of these stories where the idea for the married couples that um consent is implied and, and therefore for a man it's not that he thinks he's taking away his wife's autonomy i'm not defending this i'm just trying to think through how they're right. seeing it um, that he 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 doesn't see it as taking away his wife's autonomy. He sees it as his wife already gave consent at the wedding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I've yeah. I've spoken to gentlemen who have come out of um, Logos school, and they don't even believe marital rape is a real thing. Mm -hmm. They'll just argue that that's not real. That's that's not a thing. Um, and it has been more recent that even the country is recognizing that and starting to. I mean, we don't have a good way for handling any kind of sexual abuse, but um, slowly it's becoming illegal. Um, but mm. here it's, you belong to him. I remember um, I was pregnant with our third, very pregnant, and we were attending a seminar by Doug and Nancy. Um, and I, I had high risk pregnancy as I was in and out of the hospital uh, with my first floor, not with this most recent one. <laughs> It was the most healthy pregnancy I've ever had. My husband's amazing. Um, mm. <laughs> he took up everything. I was on bed rest. He did all the all the other things. But um, That's awesome. so I was up. I was heavily medicated to keep me out of the hospital. I had lost fifty pounds. It was it was terrible. But we're at this conference um, for their marriage, <laughs> and she. I overheard her talking to my then husband, my first husband, and saying she looks beautiful. Good job to him. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> first of all, I was drowning, um, you know, in and out of the hospital, but it was also, you're telling him good job. I don't, it, it was, it was just beginning to click that that's not normal or a healthy way to think about a person. I don't belong to somebody. I am my husband's partner. I am his ally. We work together. Um, we share the load, we co-parent, um, but he doesn't belong to me and I don't belong to him. And it changes the dynamic of the relationship when you're at that point. You're there to love each other. You, you don't take things for granted. Um, and I think it makes us a lot more respectful and appreciative of one another. Could you dive into a little bit more of the idea of, of the aftermath in terms of shunning or just whatever that might look like? How, how did the church, like when it was, when you were in it, obviously, maybe they had this sense of we can steer her back to our, mm -hmm. our, our authority, our our. <laughs> our um, our member membership, you know, sign on the, dot, the dotted line, like you said, do it yeah. our way. Um, but once they became clear that you no, know, Abra is is not doing it this way, what do they do to people like you? Yeah, 
yeah, I've made them uncomfortable. Um, I think there's a couple different personality types in the congregation. You have the very loud, aggressive people, often men, but there are some women. Um, they were the ones who were texting and calling and confronting me in the grocery store, even when my kids were there. Um, why are you doing this? You shouldn't be doing this. Um, I yeah. got the all men do this. Your standards are too high argument a couple times. Um, right in front of your children? Yep. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. And it was actually my kids that come home with a lot of this. Um, mommy's so-and-so told me you cheated on daddy. And the other, the older oh kids, my youngest son came home from school one day saying that and he climbed in the car and he goes, mom, my friend on the playground, so-and-so said that her, he heard his mom and daddy say that you cheated on daddy. And I kind of just stopped for a second. And my older girls um, were, they were like 13 and 10 and they just started laughing. They were like, when would mommy ever have a chance to cheat on daddy? She's with us all the time. Um, and so I just went with that. Like, yep, that is a silly thing to say. That never happened. People say weird things. Don't worry about it. Um, so wow. that came home. The total um, lack of boundaries is unbelievable. <laughs> right. And then um, I got a lot of, I started getting accused of being mentally unstable. And I did, I had been diagnosed with PTSD several years earlier, but I'd also been in treatment for a long time. And what was coming back wasn't PTSD. It was you have borderline personality disorder, which I had never been diagnosed with. Um, not that it would have been any of their business if I had, but that had never happened. But I went ahead and got, um, I looked up for one of the experts in our area and had another mental evaluation done. So this was like the third one I'd have um with a new doctor and she was just like no she's like yeah you definitely have ptsd but you're stable with what you're already doing you don't need to worry about that she wrote up an affidavit to send off to the courts <laughs> mm. um that came around and then just last month i had a friend of my ex um get on twitter to harass me and he was like well you just got divorced so you could go have fun <laughs> and i was like what? <laughs> I don't know. Working five jobs as a single mom <laughs> doesn't sound like a lot of fun to me. But if you know that's what you want to believe, that's a decision you're making. Um, we just so, so you know, we have a little solidarity there. The athe <laughs> atheist community gets that a lot. Where you know you just left Jesus because you want to sin. You you know God's really real. Deep down in your heart, you know He's there, and you're just fighting Him. You know you have a God-shaped void. You just want to sin. And you just don't want to bow your knee to His authority. And that is like, I mean, there's a lot of other tropes, but that's one of the most common ones. It's just, you, you, you didn't leave Jesus. You just ignored him because you wanted to sin. I am so sorry. It's, it's that's crazy. horrible. Yeah. I, well, it doesn't even make any sense. It's like, why? No, we're not, we're not five. We're not like running around the playground saying, I just want to have fun and nobody get in my way and pushing people out of the way. We're trying to be functional adults here <laughs> and give meaning to the world around us and raise our children well um yeah this is a lot crazy. of demonizing going on but um good word for so it, there's yeah. those there's a, those types of people who are just in your face but a lot of the people just cut you off um pastor mm. apple uh went from it, it when i initially saw him he literally said i'm gonna be a champion for you Abra. i know you're not used to men doing that for you but i'm gonna do that for you which should have been a red flag to me um, <laughs> but again, it's a process, uh, within a month, I would see him at my kids' sporting events. I'd see his wife at the grocery store. They refuse to make eye contact. They'll look the other way. They won't talk. There is no acknowledgement. And that was across the board, the kind of treatment I was getting from people I've been friends with for over a decade, people who I babysat mm -hmm. their kids and cleaned their house. And they'd done the same for me. I used to refill the church's, um, they had a refrigerator, so we always had food for people who were sick. Um, and I was cleaning at the church and doing all this stuff. I mean, I'd been there for a long time. I was married to somebody whose family's very active. And all of a sudden, it, was, it wasn't that you don't exist. It's that you're not, you're not there anymore. It's like... Um, it, that's gotta hurt. So it was ridiculous. It, it was shocking. It, it, I had no idea that that was what was going on. Um, to people who left. So that was an eye opener and I went back and I don't, I know I apologize to some of them. I apologize to Natalie for not um, believing her story or paying attention. I should have been paying better attention, but my head was in the sand dealing with my chaos at home. Um, believing what other people told me about her, that was, that was not okay. I should not have done that. Um, so I've had to go back and try to make reparations in those areas.
Um, and I don't think mm -hmm. people are necessarily malicious. I think they're busy and tired and the, the gospel that's being preached to them is heavy. It's, it's, it's soul shattering. Um, mm. they're just doing their best and it's, it's too much of a load. So the whole, my yoke is easy. My burden is light thing is <laughs> not exactly playing it, out. <laughs> it doesn't apply in that church. <laughs> could, could you define it's, this is a really good, um, topic. I did want to get into at some point if we, if we got here, what does the gospel in a, just a generic Christian sense mean for anyone that's maybe from a different religion? Um, what does the gospel mean? And what specifically are you referring to after that with, with the gospel that they're preaching at Christ church? Like how does it diverge or what are the distinctives? Um, the gospel is we are not enough as the way we are. So Adam um, and Eve, like people fail. We're not perfect. We couldn't do what Jesus did, which is why Jesus came to do what we could not accomplish as humans because we are imperfect. Um, and that has lifted the responsibility off of us. Now we're free to love God and love our neighbors without this Levitical list of rules and regulations. Um, he is supposed to be an ally and a helper, not, um, he's not there to make your life horrible. <laughs> it's not, in, he's not the, the angry grandfather in the sky. Um, would you define yourself yeah. as a sinner? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Would you um, use the words wicked? Sometimes. Mm -hmm. Would yeah, you? Yeah, I don't think Sorry, necessarily, I don't think it's all the time because I think, um, the image of God is reflected in us. So, and he is good. Um, so we do reflect God. We're not always evil. We're not always wicked. And the more we internalize him, I think the better people we become. And I don't think that's, um, I don't think that's exclusive to Christians. I think because we are all made in the same image, um, we can all reflect this goodness and kindness. And there's no reason to throw the baby out with the bath water. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Would you, that there's a verse that says all our righteousness is like a filthy rag. Would you agree with that? I think it depends on how you're looking at scripture again. Um, apart from Christ, apart from Jesus sacrifice. Yeah, it's not enough. We can't um, ever make up for the sin or what we've taken. Um, but with his help, we're freed from that. It's not in a in a post resurrection reality that's not something we need to worry about anymore hmm. do you and i know we're, i'm asking you first here about the plain gospel before we do the christchurch gospel but what happens to someone uh according to the bible as far as you understand it what happens to someone who does not believe in jesus when they die i don't know um i think we know precious little about the afterlife and so Agreed. I try instead to focus on what I do know about um, God, which comes primarily from my own experiences. And then um, as I've relearning what I know about him, I go to the Bible and take what I read there and kind of put it through the, the light of what I'm experiencing. Um, but there's also, there's just so much to learn. I've had to really get to a place where I am comfortable not knowing um, because I'll never, I'll never know it all. And that's okay. And that's just been a good exercise in humility for me to be like, I don't know, I know this about God. So maybe it has something to do with that. But, you know, <laughs> well, it, pardon me for diverging a little bit. But this is, I, I definitely, I don't talk to Christians, honestly, too much about this stuff. So it's interesting to to hear people's perspectives, even though I could kind of fill in some of the blanks myself, because obviously, I came from that background. But it's, it's, it's weird when you when you get away from it for a while, you literally, everything that you used to say sounds so weird to you that you're like, I would never say that. I mean, like, wait a second. I said that for 40 years. Like, yep. Of course you would say it that way. But <laughs> am I, am I okay without Christ? Can can a person be okay without Christ? I mean, I, I would not just say I'm without Christ. I'm actually very much a, a militant atheist and a Christ denier. I would definitely, um, no offense, gladly trample on the cross of Christ in any, mm -hmm. any way I could, because I think yeah. it's, mythology um am i in danger now or in the afterlife um i don't i don't know i don't know what's going on with you i don't know um i don't know the ins and outs of your life but i do know that the god i have seen and the one that's been involved in my life has not 
been um, judgmental. Um, he is empathetic. He understands what we're going through and understands our anger and our frustration and our doubts. Um, uh, you know, my kids come to me with questions. They realize that I'm not perfect, which is a good thing. Um, and I'm not angry at them for not having confidence in me or being angry at me when I do things that they don't like. That's not offensive to me. Mm. Um, I have to imagine on some level that God's the same way. Um, you- if he is actually all powerful and all knowing and all these big, big words for who he is. Um, I don't think he's easily threatened by us. I think he still delights in us even when um, we're not behaving in the way that he necessarily wants us to. Do you feel like you're open in your theology to the idea of, of universalism that God might might save save either everybody um, or at least that there's not going to be a, a fl- flaming fire of hell for the for the unbelievers? Like I don't think like- there's going to be a, I don't think there'll be a flaming fire of hell. Okay. <laughs> I don't think there's enough scripture to support that idea. <laughs> Do you think that universalism is an option on your theological radar? I don't know enough about it. I okay. do think um, that there will be lots of people. Um, I, so we don't know about the afterlife, but I, I have a hard time trusting in a God who is unable to save his own creation. <laughs> so okay. um that doesn't make sense to me if he created us because he loves us and he's excited about us and cherishes us and delights in us, which is also something you're not going to hear in Christ church. (laughs) Um, I, I don't think that the end game was to punish people eternally. Yeah. Can I ask, and this is a little bit along the same lines, but bringing it, I'm going to bring it back to Christ church a little bit and to, and to Christian theology and, and hopefully to the gospel that they preach. But you mentioned Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in that story, Adam was technically doing just fine until Eve (laughs) came along. Um, I believe it's first Timothy or second Timothy talks about Eve being deceived was, was in the transgression and that that was part of why that she needed to remain silent in the church and be submissive. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know people don't necessarily agree that that was actually written by Paul, but you know, it's, it's in the canon as if it was by Paul. Right. And when you look at this this picture of, of Eve is kind of to blame for this. Obviously Adam were in Romans were, were in Adam. So mm-hmm. we were all judicially judged as, as in Adam, he's the the head, but as of our, um, you know, of us as, as sinful people, but in the story, it, it really starts with Eve. She's kind of the chain reaction that got it all going. And when you look at the extra biblical um, quote unquote texts, such as Enoch, uh, the women are put on blast for being really the reason, um, especially, you know, mm-hmm. with, with the, the watchers, the, the, the angels that fell became so mm-hmm. tempted by the women and it became yep. so bad that God literally, the flood wasn't as much about sinners. It was about these, you know, these, these watchers, you know, getting yeah. that bloodline killed. So the, the women in the theology are the problem with Adam or the problem with the watchers they they literally caused effectively the flood of Noah. If that, if that mm-hmm. had been real, you have a theology that puts women down in the text. I know you, like you said, you can interpret things a lot of different ways and people do. Um, yeah. But do you feel like there's something embedded inherent in some of this theology that makes women less? I mean, I think that the, the texts, even if you, if you forget about the content in the, in the text, but just say how many of them were either directly written by men, or at least we think they were because mm-hmm. the name is a, is a male name and you know, right. church history and tradition says this right. is ma- male versus women. Um, you know, you, you, you look at, you know, what, uh, you know, Mary's Magnificat and a few other texts, but mm-hmm. almost all of it, I don't have a number, but I would guess 90% plus 95% of it or more is all written by men. Mm-hmm. Um, and then dominated by church elders who were all men. Mm-hmm. Do you, does, and I know I'm stepping back a tad from our main story, but does that concern you at all that the underlying narrative is so dominated by men that like, it, does it feel like it's redeemable? Um, that narrative, I don't agree with. Um, I okay. don't, um, there's a couple, uh, my church, but there's also other biblical scholars. Um, Bruce Fleming is one. He does the Eden podcast with his wife. Um, but we, 
we have interpreted the scripture not to see um, Adam and Eve cursed. Um, we don't see Eve was deceived, but Adam wasn't without sin there either. Um, mm. So the narrative that I read there is that Eve was seeking more knowledge. She wanted to be more like God, which is something most Christians want. Um, God did not bat her down after that. The interpretation has been um, heavily processed through a patriarchal uh, lens that isn't necessarily accurate, especially depending on what translation you're reading. The ESV is uh, particularly nasty to women. Um, I don't think that narrative is accurate and I don't think it's redeemable because again, you don't have um, man and woman reflecting God equally all of a sudden, um, which is what is explicitly stated in prior to that. It's they're good men and women in God's image, um, not men alone, not women alone, but together that is a reflection of who God is. Um, mm. So I don't, I don't agree with that. And I do think it, it really messes it, messes us up. I, my sons came home one day saying, and they're younger, they're um, 12 and 10. And they're like, yeah, we talked in church yesterday. They go with their dad to Christ church. Uh, we talked in church yesterday about how women are responsible for the sin of the world. <laughs> it's just like, oh, okay, oh. well, let's have a little sit down. <laughs> and it, and it really is because I don't want to create a wedge between them and their dad. I can honor the place he has in their life. Um, and I can just say, that is one way to interpret it. That's not the way I see that. This is how I see the story. I think we want to be more like God because we love God. And um, I think the snake was very nasty and very tricky. And I think Adam could have been just as <laughs> um, fooled by him. But, you know, there's a lie hidden in truth. And um, but God didn't condemn them. He didn't um, punish them. There were there were things that changed, but I don't think God intended us to live in this Eden state. I don't think that was the plan to begin with. I'm not going to say that God planned for sin to happen, but I think he was aware that that's going to happen if he knows everything. Um, mm. And he equipped us to do the work we needed to do in that state. And then when we were unable to redeem ourselves, he had a plan for that too. That didn't require that kind of sacrifice from us because we can't do it. Mm. I love that you're giving your kids a different perspective. And obviously I would personally take it a lot, a lot further, but I think it's great. It's still, still just the idea of, of beating people up with theology is just, it's so good that you're trying not to let that happen. And it's honestly just giving people the option to say, that's one way to see it, but there's also another mm -hmm. way to see it. And there might be a third or fourth, whatever. And just yeah. to give people that option, because so many of us were like, it's this way. And, you know, put your blinders on tight. There's no other way. And everybody else is yeah. just a, you know, awful, filthy liberal or a pagan and like their perspective is of course they're going to twist scripture left and right but you know we we yeah. have the, the right interpretation just to give people the choice and say there's there's more to this story um yeah and there's a lot more to it usually and there's other perspectives i think it's fantastic and I, don't, I know i'm diverging a little bit but can you also clarify go back to the gospel what would be different about the christchurch gospel or at least the way that it's coming across to that group of people um i think I think they're very duplicitous in how they present it. On the one hand, you have them saying, um, you know, <laughs> God's taking care of it. The yoke is light. Um, and in the same breath, almost, they're saying um, works. They're promoting this works-based righteousness where you have to do this. You have to live this way, um, which I it is their very narrow view um, that, only certain type of people will fit into this. You have to be, you know, in a heterosexual marriage. You have to have a lot of kids or as many as you can have. Um, you need to rule your wife. There's all these weird things happening that aren't in the Bible. Um, I remember um, when I was there, it was pretty new to get um, nose piercings and tattoos. So all of a sudden we're hearing sermons about how this is not appropriate, but that's not in the Bible. <laughs> So, okay. Uh, at one point it was hair color. Toby Sumter did a, a sermon on, or a blog post or something about hair color, unnatural hair color. Where is that? They're, they're taking their ideas of what they think holiness looks like and pushing that as gospel truth. Um, mm. And 
if you're not used to thinking critically about a situation, you're not going to recognize um, that they're pulling a fast one on you. Not necessarily intentionally. I don't want to like demonize them, but I think they've internalized ideas that aren't there in the text, but they're passing it off as if it was. Yeah, I've heard that there's, and I admit I have not read um, this book or, or some of the books that are probably relevant to this, but I've, I've read that in a review of Doug Wilson's book called Reformed is Not Enough and some other things he's written probably on his blog, that there very much is like a works mentality that if you're not careful, you know, you really can, like you're saying, it's, it's duplicitous. You're going to hear it's the finished work of Christ, you know, his death and resurrection alone on your behalf is what saves you. But, mm -hmm. and I honestly, I kind of got that myself and my, I didn't go down the route of, of Doug Wilson myself, but um, I was heavily exposed to John MacArthur as a young teenager. Mm -hmm. And he was, yeah. you familiar with, with Pastor MacArthur? Yeah. He, yeah. Um, when I was, I was homeschooled as well. And my mom let me pick um, a couple of Christian programs, radio programs to listen to. And Pastor MacArthur happened to be going through at that time, a series called Lordship Salvation which is about the idea that, um, y yes, it's Christ alone, the cross alone um, that saves you. But if you're actually truly a Christian, then it's not a human work. It's the spirit that did it in you. And the spirit's not going to start something and then leave you like a, you know, dirty, dirty um, pagan. He's going <laughs> to clean you up. You know, he's not here to just leave, you know, give you a, you know, you get, here's your getting the heaven card, you get out of the jail free card. And I don't care what you do with the rest of your life. He's going to, he's going to come in and change you. And the whole idea may be going back to that Billy Graham concept of, you know, my heart is Christ's throne, you know, get off his throne. It's his throne. You know, it's not your throne. And and if you want to get on it, you, you kind of can, but it's, it's, it's his throne. Let him rule. Right. And you end up very confused about, well, if I'm not doing enough. And I remember Bible college, people be like, Hey, did you have devotions every day this week? And literally like, if you didn't have it, <laughs> Like, well, I, I had, you know, I was in the word like eight hours a day in my classes, you know, in Old Testament yeah. survey and Greek and Hebrew classes. I was in the word like eight hours, but in terms of my devotional time, no, I really wasn't. Um, <laughs> so I, I only did it twice this week. You're like, oh, that's why you're having a rough week. Of course you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like yeah. God's going to get you. It's like yin yang. <laughs> get you if you don't take your devotion. It's a very vindictive God there. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Pay homage. <laughs> what? Yeah. And I, I can re relate to some of the stuff because Bob Jones University, as you may know, is yes. very much like that. Different theology, yeah. but um, well, how do how do people? I mean, do people do you, do you feel like some people are thriving in that community? Or do you feel like people are feeling more oppressed yeah. and just being like, we can't talk about it, so deal with it? Oh, for sure. Um, when I left, uh, one of uh, the church counselors I was seeing, not at Trinity but at a different church, suggested I start going to celebrate recovery, which is like. Um, Christianized group therapy, basically. Um, you go and you hear a little sermon and then you talk to people. But her point for me, and usually it's for people with addictions and that kind of thing, um, kind of replaces AA or something like that. For me, she wanted me to go because um, I had no idea how to process all the grief. And so she wanted me to advance safe, safe space around people where I could just like cry my heart out and know that was okay and be supported in that environment. And these people knew about grief because they had been through so much themselves and they're very caring and open and accepting people. So I was going for that, but I also had um, internalized a very perfectionistic view of myself where I wasn't enough. I was uh, felt like I was failing as a mother. I was failing as a person. And in the context of a divorce where it's contentious, you're also getting these accusations thrown at you. Um, she wanted me to realize that um, God doesn't need perfection. He doesn't need my works, um, that I am enough because of who I am in him, not of anything I've done. Um, something I did not get at Christ Church. They were very much, you know, they have their Bible reading programs that they they promote a lot of, which I I do. Um, not theirs. Not theirs. I don't do theirs. Um, but, you know, I usually read my Bible about once a year or so. And um, it had gotten while I was in that community at one point, it had gotten to the point where I felt just guilty if I didn't get in my Bible time. <laughs> and I was telling a counselor, a licensed counselor this one day, and he was a Christian, too. He's this older gentleman. I was like, I just I don't get through the five chapters I'm supposed to read it in a day. And the kids are crazy. And he stopped. He stopped me. He's like, Abra do you think God needs five chapters? 
Like, do you think he needs you to do this at all? You realize original Christians didn't have the Bible at all. They had their faith. And what do you think you're going to accomplish? Are you going to be more holy because you read more? He's like, if it's good for your soul, I think it's a good idea to internalize scripture. Um, but maybe that just means for you remembering it. Maybe it means um, reading one verse and moving on because that's all you have time for today because you're a mom, you're dealing with kids and that's a good thing. This is where God has you and that's a, but if it's not a blessing to you, what are you doing? You know, it's the um, Sabbath made for man or is man made for the Sabbath? And I think we tend to do that with our works. Are we doing this for God? Or are we doing this for ourselves to make ourselves feel like we've earned Christianity or we're better Christians or we're somehow closer to God? Or are we not in community with God and each other so much that we need extra, extra, extra to make us feel like we are there? Um mm. And there is a double standard at Christ Church for that too. I was told multiple times that I just need to get my Bible more. Um, but I've heard something that happened in my life and something I also saw uh, with my father. I try not to comment on my ex-husband, but um, with my father. And then I talked to other Christ Church wives. Um, their husbands didn't read the Bible daily. They weren't in the word. Uh, one woman actually said, yeah, he had his Bible on his dashboard of his car for 30 years. So I assume that he was reading his Bible. Um, but then he admitted later he had had never read the whole thing. He'd read bits and parts of it, but he just took it to Sunday to Sunday school. Like, mm. And so there's this double standard where the men are supposed to be inherently aware of what their Bible says, I guess. And the women are supposed to like nose to the grind on it. I don't know. <laughs> It makes me angry that they weaponize it. This book that's supposed to be um, a story. It's not a book of laws and regulations. Uh, we get to see what was happening in the Old Testament, but we're all free from that now. Um, <laughs> and so we're learning more about God's story. It's not really about us, um, but it's used as a weapon to hurt people. And that's not appropriate. Yeah, for sure. Do you do you think that some people are, are in that community more for the cultural difference? than the spiritual beliefs? Yeah, I do. And I think um, that's part of this, how they market themselves. I think um, Doug Wilson has created a space where um, it, it looks and sounds and acts a lot like a cult. Um, and they make jokes about it not being a cult, but it's really cringy because it definitely feels that way to me. Um, and when you're in it, I will say that people are super supportive. You're invited places most Sundays. There's always people to come to your baby shower. Like your kids have friends. Um, there is a false sense of safety there. Um, the way people carelessly allow their children into other people's lives in the community just because they happen to go to the same church is alarming. Um, it's very scary for me to see that. Um, I think if you're in it, there are perks, like yeah. any any cult. There's perks, there's security. Um, but that's not necessarily a good thing. That's not what we're called to as Christians, I would say. We're not supposed to isolate ourselves and then just, you know, go out and try to fix the world. That's not at all um, what I've seen presented. But apparently, I think some people are just desperate. They're overwhelmed and tired and they want to be supported. And that makes sense to me. If you had to guess what percentage of people that go to Christchurch are white, Caucasian, what would you guess is the percentage? <laughs> uh, a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, we kind of have a, a running joke in our house that, you know, if somebody is not white, then they're clearly a student in the area because that's all we got here. Um, mm. Yeah, it's pretty bad. I know when I was... Um, at Bible college, starting to be a minister myself. Um, that was one of, we had this main teacher that was like the head of the pastoral department. Great guys. I still love him. I obviously completely disagree with his worldview at this point, but uh, he just heart of gold, just real good guy. And he, he talked, he would be grieved on Sundays uh, about Sundays. He would say, you know, Sunday is like the, the least diverse day of the week for us. He's like, you're going to see more mm -hmm. people of different races and colors at work all throughout the week. He's like, and then it's like Sundays come and we go to our separate, separate corners. And it was, it was a big issue. And so obviously not 
calling out only Christ Church for it, calling out a lot of churches for it. Um, yeah. But it's it is an interesting dynamic. Do you do you ever get the sense that with any of the children that have been adopted who are from Africa that there's a whitewashing going on? I don't think I know enough to speak into that. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I know uh, for me, it's been pretty recent that I've been like realizing I was born and raised in Idaho. Um, I have almost no exposure to other cultures. This is this is what I know. And so I started, you know, seeking out books uh, from different perspectives with different um, heritages and different sexual orientations and just trying to see the world through somebody else's eyes because being white and heterosexual is that's all I know. Um, yeah. It's very isolated here, which is um, sad. Uh, my church that I'm going to now isn't that way. It's a little bit more diverse, which has been nice. Um, how would and I want to make sure to do that. How would someone be treated if they were um, even closeted as a member of the LGBTQ plus community in, in Christchurch or one of the similar churches? Um, I know there are people who are closeted there and they just fly under the radar. Um, if it's ever found out, they will be ostracized. I know parents have been told to ostracize their children um, and to cut them off if they're not repentant. Um, their own children, okay. Yep, yeah, it's mm. not acceptable. It's seen as uh, basically the worst sin you could do. Um, you're lost, you're not coming back. God's given you over to your passions. That's the kind of verbiage they use. Hmm. I wonder if that would include include me, you know, being gay is worse than being a straight atheist. I don't, <laughs> I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know where that falls on the hierarchy. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of um, people in that community who have spoken up, and I know there's probably a lot more than I'm aware of, but people do speak up from time to time and claim to either be counselors or to be involved as a quasi advocate. How mm -hmm. safe is it for people to go to those advocates? And how do you determine from your perspective who is safe to talk to about these things? And I'm, I'm obviously I'm so far away that I'm not involved in, in, in pretty much any sense, but for the people that are right there that need support where they can physically co you know, say, let's meet up for coffee and talk. We, you know, I really mm -hmm. need help. Um, I need support and healing and just, I need a sounding board, you know, to see if I'm seeing it right. When they go to people locally, how do you figure out who's, um, I'm making a, a, a assumption here, but like a, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing yeah. who not necessarily is going to, you know, tattle back to dog, but is going to push people back into that mentality, even if they never, you know, tell dog what's going on. Um, and, and who's really safe? Like, how do you, how did you figure out the right community to talk to about these things? Um, I, I did that poorly. I made a lot of mistakes and I was desperate for support and community. I was very, very lonely because I lost, um, most of my friends. I'd say I probably retained two of them out of the hundreds that I had at, um, Christ Church over the almost two decades. I lost um, a sister in the process. I lost my father in the process. They were not supportive. Um, so I was very lonely and very tired um, as a single like mom. Like JWs, to be honest. JWs do that. It, yeah, yeah. It was it was a lot. I definitely felt the weight of their shunning. Um, and I spoke to people who considered themselves advocates, and I spoke to church counselors, both at Trinity and then at other churches. And I would strongly advise people not to do any of that. Um, primary, well, there's, there's no confidentiality clause when you're talking to those people. And recently, in recent years, particularly when there is a split, when there's divorce, when there's children involved, it's been very contentious. I know of several that are still ongoing that are very ugly. Um, and my own is included in that. Um, so what you say can and will be used against you. And that is my operating uh, procedure. That's the, just the way it is, which has um, been a good way to view it. Because now, um, not only for my sake, um, I'm not going to be dwelling on all the horrible things that happen or what I feel like. Um, I'm also not going to be speaking derogatorily about other people where my children can hear because I don't want to perpetuate that cycle. Um, and I just need to protect myself and only speak in places where it's going to be safe and healing, especially when the wounds are raw. You don't want to be talking to people who aren't going to be a safe outlet. Um, so finding a licensed counselor is really important. Um, talk to your doctor. 
there's confidentiality there. Your medical doctor, um, a counselor can be trickier to find, but I definitely think it's worth it. And then I connected with women um, who had gone through similar things to what I have. Um, I found some of my best friends that way. Um, I have one friend that I've known through this whole process, uh, met her at NSA. She doesn't belong there anymore. She's in one of those marriages that's a complementarian that's working out beautifully for them. Uh, very happy for her. Um, and she has proved herself a faithful friend over the last over 20 years. So I can talk to her. Um, and but also realize that she could be, you know, deposed. <laughs> so that's, that's what it is. Uh, but other women who understand the precariousness of uh, trying to raise children with a counterparent and how to um, work on healing yourself and becoming a stronger, better, healthier person in the midst of trauma and um, sometimes persecution. Those people have been my closest uh, confidants and allies and support systems. Hmm. That's awesome. It's so, so important to have that. It's really good. Yeah. It's, the atheist community is very, um, it's different in the sense that, you know, it, it's not as much about concerns um, of, of court issues, but it's more just the, the reality that the ostracization is very, very strong. And it's, it's a cliche, yeah. you've probably heard it before. Um, but you know they say there's no uh, there's there's no hate like Christian love, and it's mm -hmm. just it's very 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 common for for atheists who are fresh out of it or even strongly agnostic to just feel lost. You know you're like, yeah. I am so happy that I'm out, but now I've got nobody. And it's like mm. building that community is so critical and figuring out like who who is going to even the counselor. Like if you want to go to a counselor, maybe if you're so used to going to a Christian counselor. Maybe now mm -hmm. you're like, I think I want a secular counselor, but where do we even find one? And how do I start? And I mean, there, there are mm -hmm. ways to easily find that, but you feel like you're just not used to going through those circles of trying to figure out who, who to talk to. Um, yeah. I was curious with all this stuff we've talked about with Christchurch, what do you think is going to happen? Like it, it, they seem from an outsider's perspective, a bit like a powder keg. And mm -hmm. that might be an exaggeration, um, although they do make videos of like couches on fire and trucks on fire. So it feels like a bit of a powder keg, but you know, yep. <laughs> it feels like you've got, you've got probably some people who are, like you said, in happy marriages, um, mm -hmm. their sex life is great and gentle and respectable. And mm -hmm. they, you know, they care about each other and their kids are doing great and they're healthy. And you've got these mm -hmm. other stories, you know, some people have already left, but some people are still there dealing with it, but it feels like a, from an outsider's perspective, a bit of a powder keg. And mm -hmm. you're, you're kind of waiting to see, you know, what's, what, what is Doug going to say next? It's going to get him in trouble. Um, yeah. and how, uh, how's he going to gaslight even more people? And this, this issue of like, what, what do they, what do you think they expect to happen over the next, you know, 25 to 50 years? And what do you think is going to happen over the next 25 to 50 years in that community? If you had to wager a guess. I, I think their goal is to Christianize the world and, uh, by that, make the world fit what their standard of biblical Christianity is, um, which may or may not be what is actually a healthy biblical standard. Um, I take a, a big issue with Christians, especially uh, calling unbiblical anything they they disagree with. Um, yeah. That's that's not something that I see represented in my Bible. Um, I see a lot of uh, support for diversity and holding space for each other and um, having room to question. But um, I think their idea is basically just conforming it to uh, whatever they think is right, which is eerie to me, especially in North Idaho, where it's <laughs> white and straight. Um, what is that looking like 10 years down the road? Well, it looks like a whole bunch of very narrow minded people um, who are very polite to each other, but outside of that, not not particularly kind people. Um, mm -hmm. What I hope happens is that more and more people will be able to see the value in the voices of people who have had experiences that they can't identify with. So we have um, quite a collection of people who have come out now, um, people who are talking about the unkindness and hatred and even unbiblical ways that Doug Wilson and his greater, um, <laughs> his his empire has treated them. Um, those people, I hope, are able to see the repercussions of the logic that's being presented to them. Um, hmm. 
I'm hoping they see that this is leading to destruction. This is leading to broken families that already has a trail of broken families. Um, and that should be a red flag. Um, I know their favorite thing to do right now is say, well, these people who are speaking up aren't Christians anymore, or they're using unbiblical or unchristian outlets uh, to tell their stories. So we're just not even going to pay any of that any mind. Um, but that's not um, that's not represented in in their own Bibles. Um, the rocks talk about God. Why can't people? Um, you don't have to. <laughs> have um, allegiances to God to speak the truth. We know the sky's blue. Um, whether you're a Christian or not, that doesn't matter. It doesn't change that. Um, you can still speak the truth, even if you don't align yourself uh, with Christianity. And I think that kind of critical thinking needs to be a muscle that we intentionally strengthen on our own. Um, I don't think our leaders, specifically those who are invested in their uh, power, uh, their financial security, or their reputations are going to be cultivating much critical thinking with us. I think that's something we need to take responsibility for and look at what it's doing, not only to our own family, uh, but also to the people around us. Um, I can't count now the times that people um, who have family members in Christchurch um, have contacted me and been like, they cut us off years ago. They've gone no contact. We have no idea if they're okay. We don't know if our grandkids, our nieces, our nephews are okay. Have you seen them? We don't even know if they're still there. Mm. Um, and that's, that's that's heartbreaking. Sad. That's not, I mean, I have experienced that in my family. That's not, where did they get the idea that this has anything to do with what God wants for them? If we're supposed to love God and love our neighbors and everything else comes from that, flows through that, um, that doesn't line up. And I think they've just, they've lost, I don't know, the forest through the trees. Um, so I'm hoping that we could call them to repentance, that they would um, see what's been happening, that there would be uh, humility and grace and kindness, and we can hold the people who are responsible explicitly for hurting others, including Doug and his family. Um, we can hold them accountable and not just hold them accountable, but also give them opportunity to repent and restore and um, bring us all back to a place where we're actually loving one another well and worshiping God well instead of infighting and um, tearing each other apart. Hmm. It's amazing to hope for something like that. Um, would you would you would you say, in your opinion, Doug is disqualified for ministry? Yeah, oh yes, yeah. I don't think he was qualified to begin with. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I've read actually quite a bit about that too. It's that's a whole different story, <laughs> but yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> But yeah, based on my interactions with him, um, specifically for me, it would include um, the way he did our marriage counseling was not biblical. But then when I went to him for help, um, <laughs> that was 2018, I went to him for help and he ghosted me entirely mm -hmm. after being my pastor, after being my teacher, after doing our marriage counseling and officiating our wedding. He just refused to respond. And I wasn't being aggressive. I was, hey, I need help. What's going on? I need guidance here. And he just didn't respond. And that is not pastoral behavior. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. I was recently watching a, a video clip from a different Christian group, um, Pastor Paul Washer. Um, mm -hmm. If you're ever familiar with him, he's probably not associated with Doug at all, but I, I'd imagine Doug and he are friends, or at least that they'd have a mutual respect for <laughs> some of their theology. Yeah. But um, he was talking, it was a it was a it was a clip about hard marriages. And yeah. Paul Washer was talking about, you know, God specifically is giving you a hard marriage to kind of like like iron uh, sharpens iron. He's he's giving you hardship. Uh, even in your mm -hmm. own home to make you more holy, more focused on the Lord, a better person. And God doesn't want to give you the the spouse of your dreams. He wants to give you the spouse that you need. Um, <laughs> and I was curious, um, number one, how you'd respond to that. But do you, do you think that that mentality is, is woven into some of the ideologies of Christ church where some of these women who might say like, yes, he's got this issue or, you know, he's not sensitive to me sexually. It's all about him, his pleasure, not mine. Whatever the issue is, he's, he's a little bit too domineering in his patriarchy when I'd, I'd really love it to be more mm -hmm. of a mutuality on some things, but it's not. Whatever the issue is, we're, but where people are saying, I'm not going to fight this. I mean, I want to fight it in the sense of I want to be more healthy and less toxic, mm -hmm. 
but I'm not going to mm-hmm. ultimately see this as some horrible thing because God is using it. And kind of a corollary question related is when women escape from this mentality where they're like, no, no, I, I can't be, we can't make this work. This is a, this is a deal breaker. I am leaving this congregation. Mm-hmm. I'm leaving this mentality. Do you think some of them look back and say, God, if they're still Christians, God, why in the world did you let me go through this? Like I would think Natalie, mm-hmm. for example, Natalie Greenfield, I, I don't know what she would say as these are words in her mouth, but I would think she'd be thinking, God, come on. Like, yeah, if, if she's still a Christian. Why would you not protect me more? And do you think mm-hmm. some of the women who go through this are asking that question saying, God, where were you in the darkest hours? Or do you think they're saying, God, this was hard, but you know what? There's a, stories of all these people, the patriarchs and all these people in the, in the Bible who went through hard things, but God did it for their, you know, you meant it like um, Joseph in, in Egypt, you meant it for mm-hmm. evil, but God meant it for good. Do you think right. they're excusing some of this away? Or do you think some of them are just like, like, God, what the hell? Like, where were you? I needed you and you never showed up. How do you think yeah. they deal with that? Um, I think from what I've seen, we all have our own ways of dealing with it. And I think um, it is possible to for both of those responses to to happen for the same person. Um, I've definitely had seasons where um, I was very angry at God and I wanted answers and um, I didn't see a point to all of it. Sometimes I still don't. Um, why is this happening? Why is it still going on five years down the road? Why can't we just co-parent peacefully? Um, there is something I think that's holy and valid about taking that anger and frustration and questions to God. Um, mm. The God I worship isn't offended by that. He isn't upset by that. I am not disloyal through my doubts. Um, I needed help to keep my faith. I couldn't do it by myself. Um, and so on the one hand, yeah, I would pour into the gospel and look at my Bible, but then the, it's triggering. If it's been weaponized against you, you don't want to be there and you need time away from it and a break and just recognizing it. And I think um, Christians tend to be afraid of the jargon around it, but being mindful to look at the world around us and to um, stop and pay attention to, you know, my children are amazing people. I hate what happened to me. Um, If I could go back in time, I probably wouldn't have married their dad. Um, We were married under false pretenses. I would not have married him if I had actually known the truth. Um, But I adore my kids. Um, So it's hard for me to, I hated what happened. But what came out of it was very, very good when I see my children. (laughs) If that's what I got out of that marriage, there are some days that's worth it to me and some days where I wrestle with it. Um, Mm -hmm. I see God as bringing good things out of really bad things. And I don't necessarily think he, um, I don't think he ordains bad things. I think he has given us free will. And so people do do bad things to each other. And then he um, faithfully brings good out of that destruction. Um, and that gives me hope. But I, I think being angry is, is an appropriate response to abuse. Um, that shouldn't be happening. That's somebody else uh, making a choice to behave in a horrible, horrible, ungodly way. And I don't think God's going to let them get away with it. Um, it brings me a lot of comfort knowing what I know um, to realize that any justice or vindication I could exact isn't going to be enough. Um, I don't, I don't have the resources. I am fallible. It's, it's not, it's not adequate, but God sees everything. It's going to be just Um, if there is repentance, it's going to be merciful. um, It's going to be made whole again. And that's where I have to put my focus because otherwise it'll just, drain me. It'll frustrate me. I can't, I'm too finite to carry that kind of weight. Mm. Um, yeah. Heavy stuff. How, how do you feel like your healing has been going on that note? I am amazed. I, I had no idea that, um, 
you know, when we got divorced, I had no plans to get remarried. Um, I was very, very hurt. It was, it was devastating. You're, I, I grieved not just like the loss of my marriage, but um, I didn't, I realized that I didn't even know this person I was married to. He, I was married to somebody that didn't exist, I think, um, or maybe part of him did at one point, And now that person's gone. I don't know when I see him now. That's I don't know that person. I don't feel like I was married to that person in a way you're grieving the death of somebody because they're not who you thought they were. Um, so as I walked through that pain, it was really hopeless at times, I felt like, I'll never trust again. And um, this is just going to be awful. And I'll just put my head down and get through this for the kids. Um, But then I was brought, you know, this, I met this amazing man who is crazy respectful, who still believes in consent, even though we're married, which is nuts to me. That's not some concept I'm familiar with. Um, Who is his love for me isn't contingent on the things I do. He just loves me the way I am, but he fully expects me to change too. And that's all right. Um, (laughs) Uh, he works hard for us and wants to lift me up and enable me to achieve my goals as opposed to using me to achieve his. Um, and in turn, I try to turn around and do the same for him, uh, which is a, a nice a nice friendship to have. I've never had um, a friendship with a guy that's like that. Like I've had best friends that are girls, but this is very cool. I had no idea this kind of thing could exist. Um, is and he then a believer? the kids. He is. Um, He was raised Baptist and then he went through some hard things as a teenager and walked away from the faith for about a decade. And I met him right as he was getting back into the church. And um, he and my daughter actually got baptized um, on the same night together. They both chose to. And it was it was really exciting to see them both want to grow in that way and parallel to each other unprompted. Um, For me, that was very encouraging. Mm. But to have this life that I never knew was possible, where my house, it's peaceful, it's happy, there's um, space for healing and uh, places to grow without anybody getting angry or um, offended. Um, You know, it's still, there's still lots of parenting. I have little kids and conflict management, but seeing this, my role is less about trying to make sure that they become good Christians and more of my role is just um, helping them become functional adults (laughs) who can Mm -hmm. think for themselves um, and not putting that weight upon myself. Like if I believe God's truly powerful, then he has control over this. And his relationship with my children is their business, not mine. Um, my job is to teach them how to, you know, work out how to share and how to feed themselves and do laundry. And um, it definitely changes the tone. Um, it's mm-hmm. not how I was raised. And it, I think it's I, it's good for my kids. We have, I have 50-50 custody. So they're going from their dad's house, uh, which is familiar to me, um, into my house where the rules are very different, uh, which can be displacing. Um, I try to keep things as similar where I can as possible, but also um, make the differences um, public knowledge. So we're not, we use our hands for blessing. We don't hit here. Um, I have conversations with my boys. They enjoy video gaming a lot about how, you know, if we expose ourselves to violence a lot, we internalize that and we become numb to it. And how is that a good way to love other people? Is that loving to other people? So, um, and at dad's house, it's, you know, free fall (laughs) with violence and that's his choice and that's okay. But on my side, this is what we're going to do. And I think it's actually good for the kids to see that, Um, There's different ways to do things and they can grow up and they can pick how they want to do things. Um, But for me in my house, uh, John and I, my husband and I, we don't, we don't fight. Um, And it wasn't because we've made this pack not to fight in front of the kids. It's that we don't operate that way. When we have a disagreement, we work it out. We discuss, we communicate, which is something they are not taught at Logos. And they're definitely not taught that at Christ church. If anything, they're taught that it's just the man's choice and she needs to submit. Um, But being in this space, what I didn't think was possible to come out of a marriage to do the worst possible thing by filing for divorce (laughs) and becoming single and to lose my, you know, my, uh, my head, my leadership and expose myself to the ungodliness. Um, But then to be married to somebody who doesn't see himself as uh, needing to be my sword and shield, he's here to 
you know, help me if I ask for it. Um, I was dealing with some rough stuff with my dad. I was like, just so you know, if he reaches out to you, this is what's going on. And he's like, I'll talk to him if you want me to, but unless you need my help, I think you're perfectly capable of handling this. It was just like, what? You trust me? This is crazy. <laughs> um, and then we recently, um, we had a baby last year, totally unexpectedly. Didn't even think that was possible at my age. It is. Um, <laughs> but to be, I mean, I, I love my kids. This is just, this is heaven to me to be able to foster a space that's uplifting and wholesome has been a dream come true. Mm. I definitely did with that. My, I've got four little ones, age eight and under, and um, they're just they're my my heart in every way. Yeah, I was curious with kids uh, if your if your kids grew up and they chose a different worldview, would would you be okay with that? Yeah, yeah. I think um, I would struggle the most if they uh, were comfortable in a patriarchal setting or were hurting other people. Um, patriarchal, just because that's where a lot of my harm came from that setting. I don't necessarily think everybody in that setting is that way, but that was definitely my experience. And then if they've chosen a lifestyle that is um, hurting themselves or hurting other people, I think it would be harder to accept. But I don't think my job is to approve or judge or police them. I think my job is to love them and support them as much as I can. And mm -hmm. that's going to look different depending on the situation. But I. I think the parental role ends um, <laughs> when they leave your house. Yeah, for sure. I did have just a few quick questions. Um, and then I, I want to make sure I pass the ball to you too, to um, just, you know, share any parts of the story that you wanted to add that you didn't get to that I'm not asking about. But I was curious with you going to a different church. Um, and this is driving a little bit back to the issue of, of the mythology of the Bible. There, when you look back at the origins of the Bible and of the narratives and of the characters, especially the, mm -hmm. the, the God characters, Yahweh, the, the Lord, is originally described as a son of a higher God, El. So there's El, Asherah, and his many sons, mm -hmm. so it's Baal and Yahweh. Eventually right. in the story, it got merged where El and Yahweh become the same, and Yahweh does have Asherah, so Yahweh is married to Asherah. And then eventually, via probably vis-a-vis -vis the patriarchy, they took her out of the picture and it's like she just dropped and she's not even part of it. Um, yeah. But you do see signs of that coming back a little bit through the text. You see uh, wisdom crying out in Proverbs. Um, mm -hmm. You see um, the, 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 there's the two Sophias, the, the, the older, wiser Sophia and the younger Sophia that's kind of making the mistakes. And you see the two Marys at the foot of the cross. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the spirit was originally, Holy Spirit was originally de defined um, in very feminine terms. Just, you know, mm -hmm. just the way they talked about it was, you know, this is like, and it makes sense. You know, you've got a father and you have a yeah. son. So there's, where's the mother? Um, yeah. So you, you would not be surprised that there's a mother figure in there. Has what some people would call the divine feminine become part of your healing journey at all? And would you be comfortable with that mentality? And if, if not, do you feel comfortable with how they wrote the female God out? Um, I don't feel comfortable with the way they wrote a female got out. Um, I am still learning about it. I um, kind of broke everything down and decided I know it's a loaded word, but deconstructed um, when I left Trinity and I've been slowly reconstructing what I think. And it's a very slow process because uh, I still have a life to live. <laughs> yes. So I'm not just reading books all the time. I read a lot, but not that much. Um, I can definitely echo that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Somebody has got to do laundry and make dinner. No. Um, <laughs> but they, my understanding, and this could be inaccurate. I'm still, I'm still thinking about it and doing research and just dwelling on it. But I think um, we see God as non-binary. Um, he's referred as both male and female. And we see that through scripture, the, you know, God is a mama bear who's, protecting her cubs but he's also you know this eagle with his wings and we see him referred to as a he um we see jesus is of course male but the holy spirit has these feminine characteristics and i would be comfortable referring to the holy spirit as a feminine aspect of god um it has been very healing to me to start embracing uh, God's image in myself as a woman, as a person who identifies as a woman, and in particularly my role as a mother. Um, that has been a great comfort to me to know that um, 
I am reflected wholly. And in some ways, you know, especially having five kids, that's something exclusive to women that we get to reflect God's creation and sustaining us. Um, and that's really cool. Men don't get to experience that. They get to experience other aspects of God's nature that women don't. Um, but it's healing to, to recognize that and not be afraid of God's femininity after being raised to think that being feminine um, was lowly and uh, suspect, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> easily deceived, um, not necessarily. Right. Yeah. It's interesting too how so many of those stories that you mentioned before, the idea of, I, th I think you mentioned it, of um, Eve had the was trying to get knowledge and you look back at you know the the jewish uh, mythology which i know only part of it gets represented in the final canon but the jewish mythology that was heavily you know evolving over generations they included i think it was at least uh, one if not two different wives for adam before eve like she was actually the second or third mm -hmm. and lilith i think was in that you know category mm -hmm. where she just like she was yeah. getting knowledge and it's interesting that that is so just uh, obviously the original stories of Lilith and the, I forget the other wife's name, but they're just not even told. And, and certainly Enoch isn't told much, but there's so much, there's just so much more. And especially the evolution of Yahweh to me, that really helps me to understand how it all came about and to realize that the, the patriarchy, like we we're, we're looking at Doug Wilson's patriarchy, but there's a much broader patriarchy that's been going on mm -hmm. for a while. And yeah, you, you can't, they're not the same, but the, the one is reflected in the other. Um, yeah. So I know. Yeah, that I think we need to hold space for, um, you know, the mythology, the stories. We, we don't know what actually happened. None of us were there. Um, yes. But we do see parallel storylines in a lot of cultures. And we need to respect that and think about how that may interplay with each other and really examine our our perspectives um, to be humble enough to realize that what we think is true or what we taught or is internalized the truth may or may not be and it's not threatening to god for us for me to be i don't know let's look into that let's go read the book um yeah. <laughs> let's read a lot of books um and listen to lectures and um something i love about my church right now is she um my pastor's female but she also uh, translates for us because she lived in israel she knows hebrew she teaches hebrew so this is these are um interpretations of the Bible that I haven't heard before. I've heard the yeah. Latin and the Greek because they teach those, but I haven't heard it told this way before. And that's been really fun to look at. And um, after our sermons, we have very short sermons, which is great. It's like 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and then we take time afterwards to just sit in small groups and discuss what happened in a safe space where we are all asking questions, but we're not uh, being aggressive and there's no debating going on, which is wonderful. I'm so over debates. Um, mm. <laughs> But it's it's been fun. I it's um, really made me excited about it again. Yeah, that's awesome. I did want to ask about the school um, and and the church in terms of science. And I know this is diverging mm -hmm. a little bit from your story, but just to be able to pick the brain of people who are in this culture, a yeah. lot of us are concerned about kids being like I we've touched on. You know, they're denied thought autonomy with uh, understanding the mythology. Um, they're denied mm -hmm. bodily autonomy in terms of sexuality, but. Mm -hmm. A lot of them from our outsider's perspective are denied thought autonomy in the sense of scientific information. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering where you land with that in terms of evolution, uh, the age of the earth, that you know, young earth creationism kind of things. I know that from what I've learned, uh, like from Doug Wilson's uh, brother with his videos, that they're very hyper into, you know, the earth is whatever, six to 10,000 years max. No wiggle yeah. room on that. Where do you land yeah. on that? And do you feel like are you open to your kids hearing the other side of that? And just where does that all fit for you? Um, I think the kids should be exposed to other perspectives. Um, one of my kids was harassed so badly at Logos that the judge ordered her out. And she went to a public high school after that. Um, mm -hmm. And so she was really getting very different stories. We had lots of very interesting conversations about <laughs> evolution, but also uh, slavery, things she'd never heard before, uh, which I wasn't paying attention to. Um, and that's mm. absolutely on me when my kids were are and were in that. I wasn't paying attention. I was trusting somebody else with their education. Um, that was an abdication on my part and a failing to think that I didn't need to be involved in that and fact checking what they were actually teaching my kids. Um, 
that's something I've had to apologize to my kids for. So I try to try to do better now. Um, as far as what I think about it, I am still learning and I like to be very careful about examining my motives um, for wanting hard answers about things that the Bible doesn't give us a hard answer on. Uh, some people read it, read this as a literal six days. Some people think it was more than that. Some people believe it was an entirely different situation. Um, I believe God created the world. I believe he did it the way he said he did. Um, I'd have to do a deep dive uh, to actually figure out, well, does it mean six days? Does it mean, well, you know, where else does he mention those kinds of um, measurements for days? And there's just so much in there and it's so poetic and what's the point um is what i'd want to ask myself in am i just going to use these beliefs to alienize or weaponize other believers is that a good use of my time um or is there something i could be doing better so if i'm sitting here studying creation when my next door neighbor is sick and needs chicken soup should i be studying creation or should i be making soup um, yeah. It's kind of my thoughts on that. <laughs> do, you, do you think we evolved from a common ancestor? Do you think we are, are connected to the primates? I think we are made in the image of God. Um, I think that uh, Eve was made out of Adam's side. Adam was made from dust and um, or so earth. You think they I were literal people. You think they were real? Yes, I do. Okay. But I also think that. Um, I think it's incredible that we cannot ignore the similarities. I think God does that on purpose. I don't think it's by chance that that we're so much alike to the primates. And that's very cool and something we should look into more. What's God telling us when he's doing that? That's That you might be a good use of our time. You don't think we evolved together? I don't. Interesting. I don't, but I, I'd love to look into it more gotcha. well, <laughs> when I, I, I have I'm... the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so much, um, so many books, so little time. I know I've asked you a lot of questions, and I hope, hope people got the, the main sense that our concern here was to talk about empowering people, um, that there's, yep. you know, bigger, there, there's there's other narratives than the ones that have been, that have been drilled into our heads, and yeah. that we're free to research and, and see things differently and to come to different conclusions than our current leaders or former leaders. Um, I hope people feel empowered to say, I need to admit that I've been traumatized by some things and mm -hmm. um, to, to, to pursue healing, however you feel is best. That That's kind of what I'm um, gleaning from some of your story, but I do want to make sure, how, what's what would you want people to take away from your story? Um, and, and is there anything else in your story that you wanted to add um, before we wrap up? I think it's, um, I would want people to be encouraged. I think um, I went from a situation that was uh, horrifying to a lot of people, but very normal to many people I know. Um, it took it, my um, my daughter says when she realized some of the things that were wrong at Christ Church. She's a teenager; she's seventeen now. She says it was like um, in the Matrix when um, Neo wakes up in the pod and the things pop off his back and he's flushed out and it's uncomfortable and painful and shocking. Um, I think that is a good way to describe it. It was all of those things for me. It was uncomfortable and painful and shocking. And um, to realize all these things I had internalized weren't necessarily true and I needed help. Um, and I, it came from a place of needing to have that rug pulled out from under me to get my attention. And I would hope that that's not the case for everyone because it was um, a horrible way to learn out I was wrong. Um, but through the process, which was awful and it was hard work and extremely painful and never something I want to ever repeat, but if it happens, it happens. Um, <laughs> um, my life is far better than I ever thought it could be. Um, I have this freedom and joy and this space um, that I've created for my family that I always wanted that I wasn't allowed to have. And so, yes, there's a lot of shame associated with being a divorced woman. Um, there's a lot of crazy stories flying around about me. Um, and I can't control what other people think, and that's okay. Um, but the reality is I'm thriving, and my kids are thriving. And that's what I wanted for them. Um, I wasn't able to help their dad. I wasn't enough for him. And that's that's humbling for me, and that's that's okay. It's sad, but it's okay. 
I can accept that. I hope he and his wife, um, his new wife, all the best. And I hope that their marriage thrives. But I, as children, it was my job as their mother to give them the best possible space to grow up in. Um, and I've done that. And it was messy and ugly. And um, I did it imperfectly. But we're getting there. And it's <laughs> better every day. So I would yeah. hope people hold on to that. I love it. That's And that's absolutely, I agree. That's in many ways, it's like, there's all these issues that we could all focus on at the end of the day. If you've got small children, like just protect them and help them as much as we can. And that's, I think about that. I feel like just about every minute of the day, and it's, I'm sure it's not literally every minute, but it feels like it's on my radar just nonstop. It's like, what can I do to help give them the very best experience and to feel loved and safe to grow up and thrive and, and to be protected from the bad stuff and uh, the toxic yeah. stuff. So that's awesome. I do want to ask too, what, what would you say to somebody who is at that spot where they're thinking I'm in this neck deep, I'm in Christ church. I've been, I'm in the fabric of it. I'm a pillar maybe of this community. And I'm realizing this stuff is some toxic stuff and yeah. I can't support it. What would you encourage them to do as a first step? I would encourage them to go very slowly. Um, take little, little steps. Um, start by reaching out outside of their um, their preconceived notions start challenging them you don't it doesn't mean um, you have to like get out of your marriage or get out of your church it doesn't mean you have to leave or anything like that um, it does mean you need to start thinking critically and for yourself um, and be mm -hmm. gracious with yourself be kind um, we don't know everything nobody will and that's an okay place to be. Um, there is no fight that you really must attend. There's very few of those in life. Um, just walk away from it. it. You don't need to argue with anyone. Um, ask your own questions. Don't be afraid to ask your questions. Um, I don't think it's my job to convince anyone of what to think or do. Um, I think we are perfectly capable of convicting um, ourselves or the Holy Spirit convicting us of what needs to be done. Um, and just be careful. Don't start, just start thinking critically, practice those skills. Mm. Well said, well said. Well, before we wrap up, was there any other parts of your story or any other um, points you wanted to make that I didn't touch on? Um, I don't think so. I, I really do want to emphasize that um, I, I didn't, I didn't leave well. And I know that um, I was exhausted. I should have left probably the first time, not the second time. Um, but women, um, I know women who have left much better than I have, who are uh, beyond reproach, who have done everything that Doug's asked them to do. And it wasn't enough. He still wanted them to stay in an unsafe and unhealthy place. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's not Christianity. That's not holiness. That's not even being a kind person. That's mean. And um, we need to rethink if a pastor says you need to stay in this marriage where say a woman is uh, being raped or her husband is addicted to watching other women have sex, or even if he's just negligent, he's, he's abandoned her emotionally. Um, he doesn't support her financially and he's not allowing her to go out and find means to support their family. So their family's not doing well. Um, if the pastor is asking you to shun family members, um, you need to step back and rethink what's going on um, kindly, graciously, recognizing that you have to forgive yourself for what you didn't know before. Um, mm. And I, I, I'm not angry at these people. I'm not angry at the people who go to Christ Church. I understand, I think, while they're doing what they're doing, why they've shunned me, because I've been there. Um, but I, it makes me sad. That's not what the body of Christ is for. Um, and how are we supposed to love anyone outside of our own uh, religious groups if we can't even love each other well? And I think that holds true for Doug too. He's having a really hard time publicly loving people who don't agree with him. Um, that's a pretty big red flag that shouldn't be uh, tossed aside or ignored. Um, hmm. Yeah, It does seem like from an outsider's perspective that that's almost a badge of honor for him. Like he, he, he seems to want people to pick a fight with him. I don't yeah. know. I might, I might be wrong, but it seems like, it, like he's like, that's, it's, it's almost like if, if you're not getting the opposition, you're not doing something right. Like you're, yeah. if you're kind of like, if everyone likes you and just kind of, yeah, yeah, good job. 
then, you know, if you're not ruffling feathers, you're doing something wrong. And it seems like he takes that to on steroids or something. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's distorted uh, passages of scripture to kind of um, hold up his personal enjoyment of, you know, bar room brawling. So yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's, like, a, I don't think that's a value or <laughs> fight the good fight. Well, um, yeah. Abra, thank you so much. Um, everyone, we've been speaking with Abra Miller. Um, Abra, I appreciate your willingness to share your story. Um, I know you've shared it in other venues, um, and I appreciate you diving into some of these details with us here today. And I just appreciate too that you're an advocate for other people who, um, you know, can th they can see that you're a safe uh, place to talk about these hard issues. Um, thank you too. I know some of this stuff has been very um, difficult. It's I know for me, I'm going through some stuff things, some tough things, and um, it's sometimes even just thinking about it quietly in the quietness of your own heart is yeah. enough to trigger you and to think to bring you almost to the brink of tears, just thinking this is so mm -hmm. painful. And I yeah. appreciate, you know, that I know what it means to take the the actual hard experiences you've been through and to have to bring it to the front and talk it through step by step and detail by detail. And um, I certainly hope it hasn't triggered you too much to go through it, but I appreciate your willingness because there's other people that probably have are able to benefit from hearing the, the truth of what's going on there. And um, certainly our wish, um, even though we'd have different worldviews and, and religious beliefs, um, hopefully our wishes for a lot of healing and a lot of happiness and a lot of good good stuff to come in the future for these families. Again, whether they stay or not, just for people to, to begin to figure out how to thrive better and to think better. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I hope, hope even Absolutely. though we you're a Christian, I'm an atheist, hopefully we can still agree <laughs> on a few, a few things. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity too. I really appreciate having a, a safe and respectful place to speak. I that is very hard to find. So <laughs> I appreciate the platform you've created and the way you, you're using it is admirable. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's definitely been a privilege and honor to, to hear people's stories. And I'd love um, maybe to put a pin in this for a few few years from now, whatever. I'd love to hear how your journey evolves over the next couple of years. You know, so please, if you ever feel like you want to jump in again and share some things that are on your mind, let me know. I'd love to have you back. That sounds fun. Thank you. Cool. Well, thank you again. We've been speaking with Abra Miller. Abra, thank you so much. Great to get to know you. All right. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.